Hello! Welcome back to Yes Fest, A Better World Rising. Heads up, if you want or need closed captions for Yes Fest, just click the closed captions button beneath the broadcast window here in YouTube. I am your co-host, Rebecca M. Davis, and I am happy to be back for day two of this festival. Hello again. I'm your other co-host, Shelly Hunter. Yesterday was great. We heard from Vandana Shiva, David Croton, Sarah Van Gelder, Adrian Marie Brown, Fanya Davis, and we were dazzled by performances by Brett Denon, Dar Williams, and Molly Wap. Today will be just as rich and exciting. We're going to give you the opportunity, we're going to give all of you the opportunity to ask all your questions with the Yes, Ask Yes Anything panel featuring our editors. We'll also lean deep into our values and hopes for a more equitable future with our transformative justice panel featuring some of the most innovative movement leaders today then Alicia Garza is joining us for a fireside chat. And because art makes visible the heart of social movements, we have some fantastic performances lined up for you. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the land we are gathered on today. We are broadcasting live from downtown Seattle. We want to acknowledge that our organization operates on the stolen land of the Duwamish and the Skuwamish tribes. We have who have always called this land home. The Duwamish people have been here in the greater Seattle area since time immemorial and still land, live on Duwamish indigenous territory in the surrounding areas. We also want to acknowledge the robust indigenous community made up of tribal diversity that originates from across the continent and whose journeys have brought them to this city by way of forced displacement or for seeking opportunity. We understand that acknowledgement alone is insufficient to address 
and begin to repair the historic and ongoing harm caused to indigenous people by colonialism, white supremacy, and centuries of attempted genocide. We believe in and we affirm the rights of indigenous people to inhabit and cultivate their ancestral lands and to be recognized, to be respected, and to be compensated by those of us who live and work here. Thank you, Shelley. We're also here to raise funds in support of YES as it continues to grow and evolve as a leading resource that we count on to bring us awareness, critical analysis, and inspiration around the most important issues of our time and the community-led solutions that are bringing about the better world we know is possible. Our goal by the end of today is to raise $150,000. Let's take a look at our fundraising progress so far. The donations that came in yesterday and the days leading up to the event have gotten us off to a great start. And we've already raised whoo, just about $72,000 towards our $150,000 goal. And we are truly grateful for each and every gift that came in yesterday. Thank you. Of course, there's no pressure to donate in order to be part of Yes Fest. We're glad you're here to celebrate 25 years of Yes with us. If you do feel moved to give at any point today, it's so easy. Just click the link in the chat or by texting yes love to 44321. And if you were with us yesterday, then you already heard that when you donate between one and $50, you will be entered to win a yes prize pack. And you also heard that we have a dollar for dollar match for all gifts up to $60,000. This means that until we reach that match, until, that, until we reach that match, all donations are doubled. doubled. At, that's right, Rebecca. After the excitement of day one of the Yes Fest, a number of board members felt moved to inspire some of you to who are able to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, we have a number of board-inspired fundraising challenges we will announce throughout the day, starting with this one. Our board members, Eli Figali and Manolia Shelton, have each donated $500 to the Fund for Our Future. And to meet our goal, they need 40 of you, 40 of you 40. to help join them. Remember, your $500 gift will be matched, so yes, we'll receive $1,000. You'll be hearing from Anolia shortly, by the way, because she's moderating our Ask Yes Anything panel. But the fun doesn't stop there. By showing up today, you're eligible to win a drawing for a brand new Rad Power electric bike. Yes. To enter yourself in the drawing, click the link we're dropping into the chat for you right now. We'll conduct that drawing sometime after 1 p.m. today for you East Coasters, that's after 4 p.m., a little bit after our fireside chat with Alicia Garza. We also want to hear from you throughout the day and hear about your relationship to Yes. So you can head to the chat and let us know, how long have you been a Yes reader? A, I'm brand new. B, between one and five years. C, between six and 10 years. Or D, 10 or more years. If you typed 10 or more years, just quickly share with us in the chat how many years you've been reading Yes. While they're typing their answers into the chat, Rebecca, mm -hmm. I can tell you that I've been a part of the Yes community for 12 magical weeks. Ooh. Yeah, 12 magical weeks. Wowzers. What drew, what, uh, what drew you in? I, you know, I love to be in places where I feel like I'm not the smartest player person in the room mm -hmm. and this is definitely that place is it kind of like when you play tennis and you're like you should play with somebody like a le maybe a level better at tennis than you no, so I, you get a little no, bit I better wanna, at i don't want to do that no i want to win you want oh for yeah. tennis yes okay so that's a bad one to use yes okay i did not know you were tennis competitive i am <laughs> but you have enjoyed learning from people who know things that you don't yes okay different it's different we should okay <laughs> thank you shelly <laughs> Oh, it is heartwarming to see so many folks who've been part of this community for the last 25 years. Yay! Let's learn a little bit more about Yes. Roll that video. The solutions that will change the things that need to be changed in the world actually exist. It's just that people are often disconnected from each other, from relationships, from ideas and from knowledge, and that that creates a sense of isolation and powerlessness. And so yes, 
we see yes as a force for creating a sense of connection and light so people will see not just their common interests but also common possibilities ways they can learn from each other in addressing the issues that concern people in communities around the country and the world they're always like setting trends i think in what people will start covering down the line because of that community centered and grassroots approach to storytelling so many of the pieces are written by individuals that are from those communities and pointing towards the importance of you know lived experience in our storytelling efforts, because the lives that we've had are as important, if not more, than the statistics we use to tell our stories. The fact that Yes is ready to uh, interview you know, across class barriers, you know, across the class divide, across racial divides, uh, across lines of gender and religion, uh, I, I find that incredibly powerful because it's only by you know, traducing the lines that, that uh, capitalist colonialism has introduced that we will be able to uh, overcome them. And yes, has always been looking to, to, to sort of breach those barriers. And that's why I've been tremendously grateful for it. And I, I think that, that without that kind of visionary storytelling, uh, we're not going to be able to, to tell ourselves a story of how we overcome the situation we're in right now. And it is obvious that Yes Magazine comes from this perspective that it is centering the views and, and needs of people who are experiencing violence from the system. So that's supportive and important and needs to continue. One of the exciting things about Yes Magazine is that it's, it's trying to look at holistically at, at the problems that we're facing and what needs to be done. So whether that involves labor, whether it involves the environment, indigenous rights or cross-border solidarity work, uh, if it involves the global economy, YES has a type of range that can encompass those different issues. Because the solutions that YES looks at are about also wellness, right, and healing, preparations. And I think that is an extraordinary way to look at the news, especially given, you know, the current sort of like place we are in society right now, the, you know, the state of the world. I think we need more stories that come from the heart and offer people solutions and how to address and tackle all that's unfolding right now. A big part of what we are up against in the world today is a problem of imagination. We are so often stuck in what politicians are giving us right now, what the apparent limits of the possible are, and Yes is kind of committed to expanding that sense of possibility. Well, what's great about Yes is it tells you, here's the long-term strategy, here's what it's based on, and here are the steps we can take right now to move into the right place in the future. It gives you hope. A lot of these things can feel huge and overwhelming and like there's nothing we can do. And I can just think of individuals I've connected with for Yes stories or other stories that I haven't written that were published within Yes and just seeing like, here is this huge issue that feels overwhelming. And here is a person who found some way to chip away at that larger issue and with whatever skills they had. What will it take to address these massive problems that we're facing? And in my opinion, and I think a lot more people are realizing this now that the biggest one of all is climate and ecological breakdown. The only way out of this that I see to make the kind of massive rapid change that we need is to get so many people in the public to make this their top priority. And since the fossil fuel industry and the capitalists have basically captured the mainstream media, independent publications that are telling the climate truth, like Yes Magazine, are critically important. My hope for the future of Yes Magazine is really simple, just that more people would read it. And I know that I'll keep you know, bringing out new voices and I'll keep telling the stories that we need to hear and I'll keep telling the truth about capitalism and about the fossil fuel industry, bringing up indig indigenous voices, the voices of people on the front lines. So they're doing a great job. They got to keep doing it and more people need to start reading it. I would hope that Yes Magazine continues to grow, continues to be a voice for those of us who want to see a better world, a world where there's more justice and less poverty, a world where people of diverse backgrounds come together to work on solutions. I think YES will continue to be a place where you can learn about all of this. Nurture our curiosity. For as long as there are the kinds of stories that YES reports on 
that show us that, that even in these times, surrounded by this kind of climate catastrophe, by this raging inequality, by in, you know, vast levels of hunger, uh, all of this is still not enough to stop movements from fighting back, resisting and flourishing. In so far as I can turn to yes and see those reminders that you know every day we fight and every day we win, I, I think that that's something we can all take heart from. Over the coming years, we're really focused on growing access to the magazine in ways that provide meaning and resources to, to larger and larger numbers of people, because that's what the work requires. The scope and scale of change that's needed in our communities and in the country requires that more and more of us feel empowered and engaged in the powerful work of building more equitable and sustainable communities. That video gives us a sense of who YES is and what we have accomplished. Few people could speak to this community or the history of YES Media better than our executive director. However, she is also here to talk to us about the future of our organization and how we are living our values as we launch into the next 25 years. Please welcome Christine Hanna. Thank you so much, Shelley. I am Christine Hanna, the executive director here at Yes Media, and we are on day two of our first ever Yes Fest. And there are hundreds of you joining us from all over, from Louisiana to California to Connecticut, and you are our Yes community. So thank you for coming together to celebrate with us today. You just watched a video about Yes, and so I'm just going to do a quick recap of what we actually do here and then get into what we see going into the next 25 years. So YES is a nonprofit, independent, reader-supported media organization that exists to inspire people to create a more equitable, sustainable, and compassionate world. Our stories focus on understanding the root causes of the biggest problems we face, including climate change, systemic racism, accelerating inequality, and a broken democracy. And YES shows the connections between these problems, and most importantly, how communities are responding with solutions that put the well being of people and communities at the heart of our systems. Many of our stories are focused on solutions emerging from historically excluded communities. And whenever possible, we hire contributors who are from the communities that they're covering, so that at least 40% of our articles are written, illustrated, or photographed by Black, Brown, Indigenous, and Asian people. We publish daily online at yesmagazine.org and in our beautiful quarterly print magazine. There's a few issues from last this past year. And we published over 400 stories last year online. Many of our stories get picked up by other media and radio outlets. And every year we get hundreds of comments from our readers telling us that because of YES, they've decided to organize and build and even run for office. Look at what they're doing there. They say, we can do that here. Or they're simply able to have a hard but important conversation that they couldn't have had the week before. So as we move into the 2020s, what is YES's responsibility now when so much of what we hold dear, truth, justice, democracy itself, feels so threatened? And as the screws of climate change turn, creating a level of planetary stress and social chaos that's going to make every effort more difficult, we believe our responsibility is to dramatically increase the number of people who have the kind of transformative experience that YES stories can create and to build that community as quickly as we can. Over the last couple of years, we've done a lot of internal work to make our team and journalism as strong as they can be as we face the future. We've committed to and invested in a path of racial equity transformation within our organization. We've hired and experienced, we've, hi, we've, exper we've hired experienced and diverse leaders, and we've invested in our journalism, our systems, our technology, and critically, in a culture that supports the well being of our staff who work so hard to make this coverage possible. With that solid foundation, we're ready to do the external work to get yes stories out to everyone who shares our values and wants to be involved in creating a better world. And there are tens of millions of people like this. You know so many of them. And together, they represent a plurality of communities. They are young and old, they are black, brown, indigenous, Asian, and white. 
They live in urban and suburban and rural places. They practice ritual and spirituality in many different ways. And they represent the full spectrum of gender identity and sexual orientation. And you know, even for the most inspiring story, only a fraction of them will actually sit down and read a thousand word article, but they might gladly listen to an audio version of the story or tune into a webinar or a podcast with the author while cooking dinner or scroll through a photo essay or a comic version of the story or watch a short video that a friend sent. So imagine if every powerful story could be told in multiple formats distributed through different networks, inspiring and connecting hundreds of thousands of people representing that plurality of communities. We can do this. We can do it through partnerships. Partnerships with other media outlets, media makers, distribution partners. We have several fantastic partnerships already. A great example is Public News Service, who converts select yes articles into short radio pieces, which are then picked up by community radio stations, often reaching hundreds of thousands of people per story. So over the coming years, we'll continue knitting together a network of partners that together are committed to covering and distributing solutions so that these stories are flowing from community to community, connecting movements, sparking imaginations, spurring conversations, because that's how transformative change happens. It's not from the top down, but when one by one, millions of people claim a vision of what's possible, when they see pathways to get there and they get inspired to take action. So that's our work at YES over the next 25 years, and why we're so excited to lay this foundation with you, our YES community here at YES Fest today. So on that note, let's get into our first session today. So we hear from people all the time that one of the things they love about YES is that they get stories and perspectives that they just don't get from other media outlets. So what exactly is it that makes YES stories unique, and just how does our editorial team do it? So next up is our Ask YES and anything session where you're gonna to get to hear from and ask questions of four of our editors. So these are the folks who seek out and choose and shape the stories that you read in the magazine and online. So uh, first I'm thrilled to introduce Brianna Draxler. Brianna is our environmental editor at YES where she leads coverage of, coverage of climate and environmental justice. Brianna has a master's in environmental journalism and a decade of experience editing and writing for National Geographic, Grist, Audubon, Popular Science, and Discover Magazine. Welcome, Brianna. Hi. Next up is Chris Winters. Chris is our senior editor at YES, who specializes in issues and solutions around democracy and the economy. He's been a journalist for more than 20 years, covering everything from local government, natural disasters, the environment, and strategies for systemic economic transformation. Hi, Chris. Uh, joining them is Sonali Kolitkar. Sonali joined YES this year as our racial justice editor. So she curates the voices and solutions from communities of color. Many of you know her as the host and creator of Rising Up with Sonali, a nationally syndicated TV and radio program that airs on Free Speech TV and dozens of independent radio stations. Side note, she is also an astrophysicist. They are joined by uh, YES editorial director, Sunavi Brydam, who many of you met yesterday, uh, in addition to overseeing our digital reporting and our day-to-day -day operation uh, in the editorial department. Sunavi is a seasoned editor who has spent most of her career covering the struggles and successes of the movement for LGDP, LGBTQ equality in the United States and abroad. And finally, here to moderate our Ask Yes Anything panel is YES board member, Manolia Charlotin. Manolia joins us from New Orleans. She is a multimedia journalist, strategist, educator, focused on building the power and capacity of those who seek liberation from oppressive systems. She's helped lead several media organizations, including the Boston Haitian Reporter, the Haitian Times, and the Media Consortium. Currently, Manolia is co-founder and co-director of Press On, which is a Southern media collective for movement journalism. She serves on the boards of Yes Media and Bitch Media, who is also celebrating 25 years of publishing this year. So before we get to the panel, one last thing about Manolia. You all know we're trying to raise $150,000 here at YesFest for the fund for our future. And we have a big goal in front of us today. Manolia is donating $500 to the fund. And to meet that goal, she's asking 40 people to join her at that level. So if you have the means to make a gift at that level, and you want to ensure that YES is a consistent beacon of inspiration, even in hard economic times, I hope you will take a minute right now to click that link in the chat and join Manolia with the gift of 
All right, Manolia, I'm out. Stage is yours. Thank you, Christine. And welcome everyone to the first panel of today, Ask Yes Anything. Before we get started, I wanted to um, continue what Christine started and talk about why I, as a board member, a proud board member of Yes, decided to donate to the fund for our future. It's important for us to have community that supports the work that we do. And for me, the YES community is about folks who are solutions oriented, folks who are lifting indigenous ways of healing, of community building, and of being in the world. And to me, donating to that process, donating to that community of folks is super important. And that's why as a board member, I donated $500. And so before we start our panel, I'm gonna ask you personally, to please join me to donate to the fund for our future. We're looking for 40 people by the end of the day, and I hope that you'll join me. So now onto our panel. I'm gonna start us off. Um, I said some questions ahead of time to folks, but yesterday's opening was so, so powerful, powerful, particularly watching Adrian Marie Brown, a comrade of mine that I have so much deep, profound love and respect for, um, in conversation, in a dance with um, an elder in Fania Davis and watching the way that they were loving up on each other, watching the way that they talk about their evolution, right? As, um, as folks who are thinkers and writers who are helping the rest of us see ourselves differently so that we can be differently as we try to build a better world. And so for me, I wanted to bring some of that spirit here and invite the editors to dance with me because I'm gonna geek out a little bit, y'all. I am an editor. Um, and I did flex my board member status to ask to moderate this panel. So I'm going to confess to that because I'm such a geek. And, and part of it is I also have heard some folks have difficult relationships with editors across our field, right? We know journalism is not necessarily a fruitful place the way yes is to work, right? I mean, we have our challenges, but the field is a very difficult one. And so for me, it was an opportunity to show some love to fantastic editors who are here to represent different perspectives, to really um, to nurture and nourish our writers, and to also bring a vision of yes in our stories. And so I just wanted to thank y'all for letting me do that flex <laughs> and for letting me moderate today and being part of this wonderful conversation. Um, and thank y'all for the hard work right behind the scenes um, and for the approach, the respect you show our writers and our audience. All right, so with that, let's kick us off. Um, so we know that yes uh, practices solutions journalism, right? We the, the, the magazine and the website um, of our multimedia production is around presenting how change makers are dealing with big issues. But my question for y'all is, I wanna learn more about the editorial process. So tell me what makes a story a yes story? I can jump in and uh, take this one. Uh, although I'd love to hear uh, also from our, our fellow editors here about uh, perhaps how they approach their beats differently here at Yes than than um, elsewhere. I know each editor we have here has a, a long career in other media. Um, so as you mentioned, Manolia, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Uh, so grateful to have you here and moderating. It's always a joy to engage with you. Um, as you mentioned, Yes, of course, practices solutions journalism. We're very proud to have been a pioneer of solutions journalism uh, really before the term existed. Um, when it was really just reporting on stories of things that were working in a world where so much was going wrong. Um, and that, to me, that's part of what drew me to yes in the first place, was to me, that's the missing link in journalism. So much of traditional journalism looks at what's going wrong in the world. There's a phrase in traditional journalism, if it bleeds, it leads, right? You, you read a traditional news story, and you hear about how many people died. You hear about the destruction uh, that was caused by climate change, by uh, gun violence, by, by political hatred. Um, and then the story ends. And it, it can be really hard as a reader, uh, let alone as a journalist, 
to engage with that and to consume that every single day. And I think the beautiful thing about solutions journalism broadly is that solutions journalism actually goes into the communities and learns about what is working. How are communities healing? How are communities recovering? How are they building? How are they innovating to solve so many of the problems that we face? So that's solutions journalism broadly. And at YES, in particular, what I'm, I'm very proud that we do is we really aim to center the communities that are most directly impacted by the systemic injustices on which we, we report. Christine mentioned some of our statistics about who writes our stories, but even more specifically, we really strive to make sure that the people who are reporting our stories, most of whom are freelancers, we have staff editors, but we don't have staff reporters. So freelancers bring us stories, they pitch us an idea, they say, here's what's working in my community. Here's a solution that I'm seeing. It might be a community garden. It might be internet for communities that are unable to access broadband. And I want to share how it's working in my community. And then what we'll do as editors is often take that pitch and ask the freelancer to expand a little bit. We'll start in a local community and then ask the writer to give us a bit broader context. That context is really key to what YES does. We really try to make sure that our stories help folks make sense of the world and start to make those connections about something that worked in this community. It may not work exactly the same way in your community, but I bet there are pieces of that that will work in your community. So those are some of the most important things uh, that, that or those are some of the most important things to me as we're thinking through stories and often questions as we're sifting through pitches uh, that each of these editors has seen me in their inbox say, okay, what's the broader angle on that? What's the national? Let's expand this a little bit. They're probably tired of hearing me say that. I really appreciate that answer because I do think that many of us, especially folks who are from marginalized communities are tired of sort of like the story ending, right? As if our lot, as if the thing that happened didn't have anything to do with our lives, our ongoing conditions, right? So I really appreciate that. And I wanna hear from a specific perspective, like Brianna, could you talk some more from your perspective about how do you do that? Because I mean, your beat is huge. <laughs> 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 but, we act, you know, but we're actively acting like this is not the biggest issue we have, right? <laughs> you know, fighting other things that we shouldn't be fighting. So I'm just curious, you know, it's such a huge beat, right? So how do you approach sort of the continuity that, that some of you was talking about? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think um, having covered climate and environment at a number of different publications, I think, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom. There is a lot of attention paid to that side of things. And then I think too often the solutions um, elsewhere focus on innovations or a scientific breakthrough that's gonna magically fix it. And I think that that is very different than the kind of solutions that YES focuses on. I think in order to address these problems, we recognize that YES, that they're social issues. And until we can recognize the human aspects that are um, driving many of these things, the inequalities that underlie the environmental issues, until we can acknowledge that, we're not really telling the full story. And so I think one of the big differences that I really appreciate is that uh, yes, considers what's newsworthy very different than many other outlets. It doesn't have to be um, very dramatic and scary and, you know, um, get as many clicks and eyeballs because it's really dramatic, right? Our, our goal is to show what is happening and that might be, you know, activists. I think a lot of places see like, oh, that's too early in the process. We don't know yet if there's any outcomes. We want to focus on the outcomes. And I think for us, we look at activism as a, a necessary step in the process. And we're going to ask the same hard questions of activists as we are of politicians, right? We want to hold everybody to these journalistic standards of like, what are you doing? What is working? What's not working? How did you get there? And I think that um, especially in climate and environment, what really strikes me about the yes approach, and I really appreciate is that we have a very different idea of who is an expert. We think the people on the ground with lived experience are the experts who have every um, credential they need to tell us how their world is and how to fix it. I think a lot of um, science coverage in particular, you know, puts the emphasis on degrees or on 
um, you know, really fancy titles. And I think that's one of the things I especially appreciate about our climate and environment coverage at YES is that the experts are the people who are living the realities and who are solving these problems. They're not waiting for some innovation to come and fix it. They're just on the ground fixing it in their own community because that's how they get to tomorrow, right? And so recognizing that climate change is here, it's happening, these communities are affected right here, right now, and they're making positive change. And that, you know, that, that inspiration, that can spread, that can be shared, and every community can and should be doing, doing more to recognize this, you know, this emergency that we're in. Thank you so much for that. You provided a perfect segue for me to bring Sonali in this conversation. Talk about big issues um, and big conditions and uh, that we're and constructs that we're dealing with. You know, there's nothing uh, right now besides you know our planet needing us needing to confront the big issues happening across our planet and it's its health. There is the racial disparities, right? The racial violence, the racial terror, but also the racial justice that folks are seeking. And uh, so Nali, I wanna hear about you in terms of like, same, same question to you, but with, with a bit more specificity, how do you approach, you know what I mean? Like understanding what a yes story is because you've been doing this for quite some time. So now that you are doing it with this, this wonderful group of people, how do you bring your, your lens for you to understand what makes a racial justice yes story just that? Um, yeah, it's been amazing. Uh, I've joined the Yes family since just July of this year. Um, before that, as Christine mentioned, my background has been in broadcast journalism, although I've been a writer um, at various outlets. Um, and one of the things that drew me to Yes was this sense of hopefulness that we're exploring journalistic solutions. And, you know, even progressive news outlets tend to fall for this same sort of trap of doom and gloom. There are so many you know, shows out there or writers out there who get a lot of attention because you know, their basic approach is the sky is falling. And so I was kind of tired of that cynicism and, and I'm so pleased that Yes's um, approach, you know, which has been, it's been taken for 25 years, is more and more being embraced by, by journalists um, and, and that this is, you know, yes, was ahead of the curve 25 years ago. On the issue of racial justice, you know, it's it's something that we're now seeing more clearly than ever. And maybe the Trump years made this more, more stark for everybody, how racial injustices have been baked into almost every issue you can look at, right? So there's always an angle around racial injustice um, that you find when you're looking at climate uh, change or capitalism, colonialism, um, in income inequality, uh, women's issues, reproductive justice, there is always a racial justice angle. There was a moment when the left sort of forgot that, you know, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of Occupy Wall Street this week. And those were big internal struggles on the left when there was this sense that, um, that, that we didn't have to worry about race, that it all boiled down to class issues. If we could just solve class issues and the race issues would solve themselves. And we know that that's not true now. And I think finally we accept that. And yes, has embraced racial justice issues as a really, really important aspect. So we look at racial justice solutions in many different ways. Um, reparations is a really big one. You know, what people are doing in grassroots communities to, to, to take back power. I think my uh, audio is a little bit problematic. So I'll, I'll uh, stop here and see if I can and fix that with some headphones. <laughs> Thank you, Sonali. Um, you helped me segue into my question for Chris. Um, around choosing themes. So how, how does Yes go about choosing themes for the magazine, which is a very specific you know, platform, right? And the verticals and the broader verticals that cover specific issues, like for instance, environmental justice and racial justice, right? So Chris, can you talk to us about the process of choosing the themes for the different areas um, of Yes Media? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, regarding the... Uh you know, the day-to-day -day coverage, you know, this, there's a, there is an element where we, 
you know, react to what's happening um, in the news. But there's also an element of where we're strategizing and we're trying to pay attention and, and trying to look for where, where the trends are, what the inflection points are in, you know, the various dynamics that are playing out. Um, and for the print magazine, it's actually similar, but with much more longer lead time. And it makes it a lot more difficult to try and, you know, predict what's going to be the issue of the day six months down the road. Um, so th that forces us to skew towards more universal evergreen type subjects, even if we're talking about something that is as specific as housing or as specific as decolonization. We are looking at, you know, an issue that is going to be taken a lot more holistically um, so that we can look at it in the context of the day and six months down the road, it's still going to be fresh. And even a year later, two years later, five years later, 10 years, we would hope um, it would still be fresh. So um, the, the two processes are, sim are similar in that regard. Um, main difference being in how much advanced time we have to prepare for it. And as far as our coverage on, on the, uh, the website goes, um, there's a bit of a reactive element, but there's also, um, you know, a lot of forethought that gets put into how we see, you know, various trends moving. I mean, I watch, you know, economics and, and, and politics and, you know, politics was, you know, very much up front and center over the previous four years. And of course we have a much more boring government these days. So it allows us to focus on, 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 you know broader things um but it there's always just a way of trying to consider systems holistically um i mean it in the root of the word systemic is what is the system we are looking at here and and that's you know gets back to the earlier questions you've asked you know i come from a mainstream news background newspapers magazines that sort of thing there's a lot of stuff that never that there's a lot of systems that get taken for granted um, it's always the subtext when you read your daily paper um, that if we're reporting on a company, it's how much money they made, but we're not talking about, you know, you know, how much of that money is going toward paying worker benefits or anything like that, unless there's a strike that forces the media to pay attention to it. So looking at those systems and trying to understand everything in there um, and not just what's happening right in front of our eyes, I think is, is key um, when it does that. And, you know, I, we, we did a, um, a bit not too long ago about Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics that actually delves into this and talking about the whole economy, not just what gets reported on balance sheets. So, Thank you for that. Um, so we're going to go to audience questions soon, right? So I want to make sure that those of you at home watching us, that if you have any questions for our editors, this is the time to do so. Um, but I want to ask a little juicy question um, because I I find that um, newsrooms that have a plurality of leads and people who are thinking you know deeper about systems and structures, there are some nice robust debates, right? So I'm curious, you know, what was the last robust debate that y'all had? either about covering a particular issue or a story? And then how did you all, um, what came out of that that was, a, that was a beautiful thing that you all learned about having different perspectives, having a plurality of perspectives, as some of you put it? What did you all learn about that process? So basically what I'm asking, I'm asking for some tea, okay? I want the tea. Um, how do y'all go about doing that? There are a few. Uh, <laughs> so broadly speaking, uh, we absolutely have have robust debates. Um, we have periodic pitch meetings uh, as we're planning content for the months to come. Um, of course, we, we start talking about the various holidays that are coming up, uh, all these kinds of things, and everyone brings in their, their unique perspective. Um, there are times, uh, and actually in, in the past year, um, we had we made two two issue theme or two issue pivots in the middle of a production cycle. Our standard production magazine project production cycle is thirteen or fourteen weeks long, and uh, I can't talk about the magazine without um, giving credit where it's due to our executive editor, Zenobia Jeffries Warfield. You'll see her later today in conversation with Alicia Garza. Um, 
Zenobia leads our print, uh, the print publication. Uh, so this this is this is all with a lot of gratitude uh, to Zenobia. So uh, in March of 2020, as as you all may know, um, this this little virus landed here in Seattle, where we happen to be based, um, and changed the world. Uh, and so we abruptly shifted to working remote, like so many other people in the world. And we were halfway through a production cycle, uh, working on an issue on migration at the time. Um, and we pivoted uh, and changed the issue theme. We were halfway through and decided that instead of focusing on migration as we had planned to, we would look at um, community power and the ways that communities were responding to the crisis of the pandemic as it impacted them. Um, and I actually was on parental leave. Uh, my spouse had a baby in March of 2020. So um, Chris and Brianna uh, and Zenobia and the team we had there were really responsible for that issue. Um, it came out beautifully, uh, but it was done remotely in about half the time. And then our next issue, of course, uh, we had a different theme planned. Uh, and then George Floyd was murdered. And uh, we pivoted again um, to produce the Black Lives issue, um, which was produced in partnership with Color Lines. Zenobia also heads up our editorial partnerships. Um, and that ended up being a really meaningful partnership. Um, Angela Bronner Helm came on to, to serve as a co lead editor on that issue. And we produced a beautiful issue um, that where the entire theme section was written, photographed, and illustrated by Black artists, writers, and photographers. Um, that issue sold out. Uh, we had folks buying boxes of the issue to distribute through their communities. Um, so, so those are a couple of the ways that we do try and be responsive. Um, we could probably get into more tea, but I also see <laughs> some audience questions uh, coming up. And, and I will say that there is, there is broad debate, right? We have debates about being anti-capitalist. Are we anti-capitalist, right? We have, you know, what is the place uh, we have folks who, who are kind of, you know, want to uh, want to dismantle the system. And we have folks who believe that the place is to work within the system to push for change. And for me personally, I believe that it takes all of us to create that new vision, right? You have to, because you can't automatically blow everything up starting on day one, uh, even if we might want to sometimes. But so you are going to have to have some folks inside, inside the system who will push for change as you are again, working to dismantle these unjust systems. Thank you, Sanavi. That was a very editorial director like. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna move to audience questions. Um, we have one from Ken who asks, I find, I often find stories in ES that come from solutions in marginalized communities. These are often accessible and scalable. Do you actively look to these communities as leaders? It's a good one. Uh, Brianna, you want to tackle this one? Yeah, I was going to say yes, absolutely. That is the bread and butter of what we cover. And I think, um, you know, what what brings it to scale and really um, provides more of that replicability elsewhere is we ask the questions about not only what's working, but what what struggles did you have along the way? What lessons did you learn? What didn't work in getting to what did work? Because I think if if by sharing a story and including both the challenges and the solutions, we can save another community from having to make the same mistakes and going through the same painful learning processes, I think that can move solutions faster. So yes, these communities are absolutely at the heart of what we look for and what we cover and who we, who we center in our coverage. Um, and I think that that uh, really speaks to the fact that like, this is where solutions are coming from, right? It's, it's, these are the communities that should be lifted up and listened to and and seen as the experts. And so that is that's exactly what we try to do. That's great. Um, I'm gonna change the order a little bit. So y'all because so for folks back home, you know, behind the scenes, we got a whole elaborate situation here, right? There's like comments and questions, and so we're all seeing the same thing. So I'm, they, they gave me the baton to sort of orchestrate. So I'm going to just do my thing here. Um, we have another question from Alyssa who asks, what does your collaboration and issue planning process look like? Mm. Um, very collaborative. Um, I, you know, we, 
I mean, it used to be that we would gather around the table in the office and then we would we would hash out themes and have long meetings and then and and discuss what it is we're going to um, pick for each individual issue, what the what what seems to be likely the theme. Um, and then when we uh, and now we're doing it online, of course, but when we, uh, you know, we start looking at an individual theme, we have a a process of going through a number of questions we want to ask about these issues. We, we start looking for, you know, where do we think the uh, the pressure points are in this issue? You know, who who is most affected by this? Who's being cut out of this conversation that needs to be brought into the conversation? And some of it is list making and some of it is somewhat performer, but it, it's it's kind of a system that we've, we've built up over the years to force us to think holistically about um, these issues so that we are going to be looking at these from a lot of different angles. Um, so that we can have an issue that is all about a single issue, and it's going to be coming at it from all sorts of different angles. Um, so I think that you know, and, and as we do that, when we when we finally put out our our public facing call for pitches, that reflects a lot of that discussion. So that we have a number of you know prompts usually within those call for pitches, so that the writers who actually see those are able to look at that and look around them and what they're looking at what they're reporting on and saying, all right, here's a story that might have a yes angle on it. I'm going to pitch that one. And then when they all come in, then we review them all. We work with a lot of the writers to see if, you know, if things we feel things need to be reframed a little bit or changed in this way or another. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of that back and forth, but it's all about trying to make sure that we are covering um, a subject in, in as broad a manner as we are, and that we're going to you know, make sure that we, we touch on all those issues that are relevant to our readership. Thank you, Chris. I actually, we have one question that's that's kind of broad. And so I want to throw it to the whole group to see who wants to catch it because it's a pretty big one. Um, Lori asks, systemic and evolutionary, how are these systems evolving or in what direction can we steer that evolution? Um, I'm gonna take my, my take on this question is really about the, the kinds of systems that you all are covering at YES, right? So, and what you are observing as folks who are deeply involved with, um, you know, uh, issues that continue to evolve, right? Um, and so I wanted to get your your take on, maybe each of you could tackle something quick, maybe Sonali, then Brianna, and maybe come back to Sunday to just give your take on, you know, systemic and evolutionary and how, what do you think? Should the systems, are they evolving? How are they evolving? And should we be steering that evolution? So Nali, I think that, again, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, there you go. Um, I think uh, if we're talking about systems, right, these are big issues. And depending upon whether one is hopeful or cynical, you can view things differently. Um, we are actually seeing systems evolve in a direction toward progress, even if it doesn't seem like it. And I truly believe that. Um, if we, we have setbacks and, and as journalists doing search solutions journalism, we do have to look at the big picture. So we have to look at you know how are people more engaged in the democratic process now than they were before? Are they more engaged than they were before? And it's a push and pull, constant push and pull. And our job as journalists is to lift those voices, those transformative voices, um, above the noise and rise up above the corporate media, the media that is there just as clickbait, the doom and gloom. Uh, if it bleeds, it leads, as Sunvi was saying. Our job is to rise above that to show the patterns that systems are indeed changing so, for the better. I think the only thing I would add is the fact that these systems were created by and for people. And so if they're not serving the people, like we can change them, right? It's not some external entity with its own life, right? Like these systems are here for us. And so if they're not working, let's change them and we can change them. And I think seeing and recognizing that um, is a big part toward, toward movement, toward that change. Mm, I love that. Son of yeah. I would agree. I think you know the the people uh, are really to me what what I where I see the evolution and 
and in an, a growing awareness um, of, of intersectionality in the words of Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, um, but really of folks understanding that that our, our liberation is bound up together, uh, to quote Audrey Lord, and realizing that we don't live single issue lives, right? Climate change is is connected to migration, is connected to food insecurity, is connected to violence, is connected to racial justice, is connected to housing, right? And I think that I'm, I'm starting to see more and more folks wake up. And in some ways, I think COVID has, has been a wake up call for a lot of folks to really understand that like, you know, wait a minute, there were there were many of us, frankly, all of us, I think, you know, at least most of us here on this team who were, when COVID hit, we were able to go and work from home. And there were millions and millions of people in this country and, and billions around the world who didn't have that opportunity, right? And what does that mean? What? It, how do we create a society that actually takes care of its people and, and creates systems that allows folks to, when a pandemic strikes, to be able to care for their families and be able to support their own health, their own mental health, their own physical health, their own and the environmental health of the planet on which we live. And I think I'm seeing more and more folks wake up to that reality. And that is the evolution to me that is most exciting because I think that that is, that's what's going to have to happen if we're going to, uh, if we're going to survive, if we're going to make it through what is coming down the pike. Thank you. Y'all rock that. That, that was a really big, broad uh, question to answer. So thank y'all for that. Um, we'll take two more questions from the audience before we start to wrap up. Um, one of them is quite serious and the other is fun. So we're going we're gonna, to, we're, let's close on fun. Okay. So um, Susan asks, are there stories out there of people recognizing U.S. responsibility behind refugee crises? That includes also wars in which in which the U.S. is involved. That encourages a more welcoming stance toward refugees. Um, I'm going to add a personal note here. Um, I am of Haitian descent, and um, it has been a quite difficult year for my people in my country, but particularly, you know, being Haitian American, right? Holding these two identities right now in 2021, when there were hundreds and thousands of migrants at the border um, being treated, uh, I don't even want to say inhumane, just being treated with complete and utter violence, right? So this, this issue is super personal to me, and I'm sure I'm not the only one here, but I wanted to sort of personalize it. So when, So I really appreciate this question because I think that um, figuring out how to cover something like that from a solutions-based, you know, from a solutions approach may be difficult. So what, how do y'all wanna answer Susan's question about finding a ways that can encourage a more welcoming stance towards refugees? And do y'all think about that? Uh, absolutely, I mean, this is precisely the kind of work that yes has to do making those linkages is critical because the solutions become apparent when we examine the root causes uh, if we're just examining solutions without looking at the root causes then our solutions are going to be unconnected to it's it's a band-aid it's going to be unconnected to the reasons why things are happening and it's not going to actually solve things in the long term so if we don't address u.s imperialism in interference in other people's democracies, we're not gonna be able to have adequate solutions for why there are refugee crises in the first place. And so it's our job as journalists covering these issues to make sure that we're highlighting that broader context that often gets missed in corporate media. Anyone else wanna weigh in? I, just... I think the other thing I would say is we, we just cover examples of countries that do it better. Right. There are plenty of places that are much more welcoming than we are. And to be able to show like we don't have to be this way and we are not, you know, some shining example like these are countries doing it right and doing it well. Let's let's follow their lead. I love what, that. What they said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I really appreciate that because I, I do think some of these big issues that y'all cover, I think that from the, the American perspective can be very um, insular and it feels like, shit, if we, we mess in this room, we're gonna mess up the whole world, right? We don't realize that, oh, there's a whole other world out there that are, de that are dealing with these things differently and they can inform us and help mm -hmm. us move towards a different direction of how do we deal with these big, 
these big issues. So thank you for that. I really appreciate that perspective. Um, moving us into a little bit more fun. Um, Jim wants some tea from y'all. Um, Jim asks, can you give us a sneak peek of some of the themes that you are considering for upcoming issues? I feel like I should uh, side slack Zenobia and make sure she's okay with us sharing some of this. Slot uh, <laughs> <laughs> <in> her DMs. <laughs> we certainly can share that um, our 100th issue, which will be out on stands um, towards the end of the year here, will be on the new social justice. It will be looking at the way that today's movements uh, take their lead from the movements that came before them and, and how they push forward into really building that world we all wanna see. Um, it's gonna be a really exciting issue. Um, I think every one of these editors you see here is writing a piece uh, in the issue. So you'll you'll hear more and more from, from each of these. Um, and then we have started discussing um, other issues as Chris mentioned, uh, we work uh, two to three issues out, um, generally speaking, right? Which is why we can sometimes make those pivots. Um, so some of the other themes we've discussed, um, so we've discussed the future of work. Um, that seems to be a, a big conversation happening right now. Um, we've discussed pleasure um, in, uh, in, in the style of, of Irene Marie Brown um, and, and understanding a pleasure activism, the need for rest. Um, Wait, and I have, a, I, have a, I have a request and I'm mm -hmm. happy to help make this happen or just Put the pressure and harass her to make happen. Um, have y'all considered having Adrian guest edit that? But maybe it's not just Adrian. Maybe after because after that, that panel was so powerful. I just want to see them together more and more. Maybe it's we ask Adrian and Fania to do it together to guest edit a pleasure. You know what I'm saying? But with like restorative justice angle, mm -hmm. right? What y'all think? Yeah. No, that's the dream. We'd love it. Yeah, we, uh, Adrian, if you're watching, uh, call us. You know where to find us. Um, <laughs> About to slide in our DMs. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and right now, uh, we actually just published our call for submissions for issue 101, uh, which is a little bit different. It is um, your personal social justice journey. So we are looking for personal essays from readers, from journalists, from, from activists, from social change makers to share a bit about how they how they kind of awoke to to the change that they were able to make in their communities. Um, and so you can find that call for submissions on our website right now. Um, and so that that issue will be coming out in the spring. And it's a little bit different. I'm really excited to, to see that. Um, that is very exciting. Um, I, like all those all those areas, they're they're ripe for new ways of thinking and being. So Thank y'all for, for continuing to push that. Um, we're gonna get ready to start closing. And I, I have my very my very last question um, for the for the team. Um, and I wanna make this if I can do a short answers from y'all. If you can say in um, in one sentence, mm -hmm. what makes a yes editor a yes editor? Mm -hmm. We're going to use up all our time reflecting. <laughs> when you stumped the editors, that's how you know it's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are a reflective, uh, pensive team. <laughs> oh, well, that could be one of them, right? A reflective and pensive person. Yes, I like that because you need that in the editor. Lord knows. Mm -hmm. We make an effort to tune out the noise and look at the heart of the issues and ask the questions about why these are issues to begin with and not just reacting to it. Uh, we are not gatekeepers, ideally. Similarly, I was just going to say, I think we get out of the way and understand that our purpose is to make the writer's voice and story the best it can be and to really shine. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful, powerful. Y'all could tell, I didn't, they weren't picking that question. I said, it, I teed it up because I felt like their responses would continue our overall sort of pitch to folks 
about why it's important to support this work, right? These editors are working with fantastic writers and multimedia producers, content producers, to in a way that is fostering community. And we're, we hope that you will join us in continuing that process um, to donate to the fund for our future. Uh, I want to thank again our editors, Rihanna, Chris, Sonali, and Sunny V. And thanks to all of you for asking your questions. Um, we Again, we hope that 40 of you will join us at the $500 level. Y'all can join me, the 500, the 500 crew, um, <laughs> and support this wonderful work. And thank you all again um, for the opportunity to hang out with some of my favorite folks producing some of my favorite journalism. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Manolia. <sighs> Thank you, Manoya. You've just heard from the YES editorial team about the range of topics and issues they cover, racial and social justice, economics, democracy, climate and the environment, and how they cover those issues. Now, if you haven't already gathered, we like hearing from you. So I have another question for you that I'd like you to answer in the chat. Um, think back to when you first started reading YES. What was the first issue or topic that YES helped open your eyes about? Can I answer that? Oh, yeah, please do. OK, uh, so I think for me, it was reading an article in Yes that first introduced me to the concept of harm reduction mm -hmm. and how there are different models, possibly, for accountability in community. So let's see what our audience has learned. I'm going to look over here mm -hmm. and see. Let's see, Rebecca. Oh, we have uh, lots of people pitching in. I see Jim is talking about the concept of ownership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Really? Yeah. There we go. Uh, oh, and I go also ahead. think I'm really interested in the fact of Adrian Marie Brown being a part of the magazine so prominently. I'm a big reader of hers. I'm working through emergent strategies and pleasure activism, hmm. which I think is incredibly important for us to working in social justice circles that we really move into the space of healing and care and paying attention to our needs. Hmm. Uh, that is wonderful. Well, thanks for sharing with us. We'll definitely be hearing more about social justice a little bit later in our transformative justice panel. Mm -hmm. Remember, if you want to invest in the next 25 years of YES, it is so easy. All you have to do is text Y-E-S-L-O-V-E -E to 44321 or click the link that's in the chat. If you were with us yesterday, then you heard about our awesome matching opportunities I'm gonna pause. I saw that someone came in at $1,000 and a couple of people came in, two people came in at $500 okay. to match our board members, Eli and Manolia. But there's plenty of room at those levels to come in. So we, we really hope that you'll join us. Now, I just wanna remind you that we're able to match all gifts that come in during Yes Fest up to $60,000. Any gift in any amount can be doubled thanks to the match. So dig deep. Dig deep and maximize your impact. Plus, I have another board challenge to announce. Mm -hmm. Our longtime board member, Elisa Gravitz, mm -hmm. has made a generous gift of $2,500 to the Fund for Our Future. And she's asking, and we need um, two people to join her at that level of $2,500. That's right. We're looking for two of you to join us at $2,500 with a gift. And remember, Giving at that level means your gift will be matched and turned into $5,000 for yes. This is so exciting. That's so exciting. We have just over two hours to get to that goal of $150,000. Remember, donating is not required. Your presence at the celebration means the world to us. But if you are able and moved to donate, your investment is welcome. Make a gift that's meaningful to you. Gifts at all levels make real impacts. And a friendly reminder, by being here at Yes Fest, you are eligible to win a drawing for a brand new red power electric bike. Woot! Enter yourself in the drawing by clicking the link that we're dropping into the chat right now. And we'll conduct the drawing sometime after 1 p.m. today. It's 4 p.m. for our East Coast folks. With, uh, and a little bit after our fireside chat with Alicia Garza. And as you consider the ways in which you want to partner with YES and our work, let's hear from some of our other amazing YES supporters. 
Happy birthday, yes. I'm glad to be a small part in your 25 year history. And, you know, we have to keep going and I hope to see you for the 50th. My birthday wish to yes would just be for um, all the great people at the magazine uh, over there on Bainbridge Island, which I had the, uh, the, the great joy of visiting one time to just throw themselves an awesome party and have a good time. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday yes, yes magazine. magazine. And may you have 25 more productive years. This is from the Goldens of Bainbridge Island, Washington. Uh, happy birthday to Yes Magazine. It's been an honor to be associated with uh, with all of you guys for the last couple of decades and uh, hoping for 25 more. Well, I can certainly say happy birthday, Yes Magazine. And I flash back to when I was there on the island in the bookshop. They are celebrating with you, but also our book, Daring Democracy. And, um, and I hope for many more opportunities you were always so encouraging of me um david fran the whole team and i feel that we small planet institute and yes magazine will be partners forever <laughs> so thank you and thank you for all your brilliant work and your determination what we need is to tell the stories of what is working and what people are actually trying to do you know, not to say that any of those are going to solve everything, but they are steps toward it. And unless we start to cultivate that type of hope and tell those stories, um, we're going to be stuck in this critique and feeling like uh, all, all is lost. And yes, has really helped contribute to, I think, to the movements that I have seen emerging over the last quarter century that, that really are providing that hope and inspiration for many, many people across the world. What a walk down memory lane. It is incredible to see the amazing range of people who've been part of this 25 year history. Now let's sit back and enjoy another wonderful performance. This next woman has been named one of the most politically relevant artists in her genre by Paste Magazine. Here's singer songwriter, Ray Zaragoza. Hello everyone, I'm Ray Zaragoza and it's such an honor to be here performing for all of you. I'm here in Long Beach, California, and it's so great to hang out with you wherever you are. I wanna wish, yes, a very happy 25th anniversary, and I'm so excited that we're all here getting to celebrate together. I'm going to play a song uh, called Warrior, and this song is about facing your fears and facing the vulnerability of standing up for what you believe in and doing what you know to be right. And um, the song is also about finding that inner bravery when you're feeling afraid and just taking that leap when it feels really scary. And uh, so I thought it'd be a good song to play today. And um, thank you all so much. This is a warrior. Spent my summer in a van, St. Augustine to Michigan. Held my breath, said a prayer. All those people waiting there, I've been searching so long. It lived in me all along. Burned me in the desert and drowned me in the rain. Throw me to the thunder, push me out of the I don't feel afraid anymore. I'm a warrior. Bright lights sharing tears. 
thanking grace for bringing us all here. It ain't lonely on the road when there is love everywhere you go. I've been searching so long. It lived in me all along. Burn me in the desert and drown me in the rain. Throw me to the thunder, push me out of the I don't feel afraid anymore. I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior, we are warriors. Burn me in the desert and drown me in the rain. Throw me to the thunder, push me out of the plane. I don't feel afraid anymore. I'm a warrior. Thank you so much, everyone. Again, I'm Ray Saragossa, and happy 25th anniversary to Yes. I will see you all soon. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Ray. What an incredible voice and spirit. You can learn more about Ray Zaragoza's album, Woman in Color, and tour dates via the link in the chat. Hi, my name is Sonali Kohatkar, and I'm Yes Magazine's racial justice editor. It's my great pleasure to moderate our next panel now, which is called Transformative Justice, Thriving Forward Together. The idea of uh, transformative justice originated as a response to gender-based domestic violence. For example, Mia Mingus, who's a California-based organizer with the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective, described transformative justice as a, quote, political framework for responding to violence, harm, and abuse without creating more violence. So rather than relying on the criminal justice system to, say, address uh, violence against women, transformative justice advocates have explored nonviolent approaches to redressing and repairing harm by examining the root causes of harm, the unequal dynamics between aggressor and victim, etc. So how can such an approach be applied to the broader array of the harms that we face today, such as racial and gender inequities, mass incarceration and state violence, economic injustice, abuse of immigrants, or the climate emergency? We have a wonderful panel of guests today who will help to answer these questions and share their vision of what transformative justice looks like. I want to first introduce Amanda Alexander founding executive director of the Detroit Justice Center. She's a racial justice lawyer and historian who works alongside community-based movements to end mass incarceration and build thriving and inclusive cities. Also with us is Dallas Goldtooth, an organizer with the Keep It in the Ground campaign of the Indigenous Environmental Network. He's a Dakota cultural language teacher, nonviolent direct action trainer, water protector, and co-founder of the Indigenous comedy group, the 1491s. Also with us is Mariah Parker. She was elected county commissioner in Athens, Georgia in 2018 at the age of 26 on a platform of criminal justice reform and raising the minimum wage. She's also a hip hop artist, 
and co-host of the podcast, Waiting on Reparations. And last but not least, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign with Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. She is the director of the Kairos Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice, and the editor of We Cry Justice, Reading the Bible with the Poor People's Campaign. Thank you all so much for being here and welcome to all of you. So let's start, first of all, with each of you giving me your brief definition of what the words transformative justice means for you before we get into how they might apply to the societal problem that you focus on. Amanda, I'd love to start with you. What do you what, what did those words mean when you hear them? Sure. Uh, first of all, it is so great uh, to be here with you all and happy 25th birthday to Yes Magazine. Um, I think transformative justice is really about not just focusing on what we're tearing down, um, particularly when it comes to things like incarceration or policing. It's really about being bold enough to use our full imaginations and to think about the range of things that need to be built up in order to make sure that we're making um, you know, the current carceral state obsolete. I'm excited to talk more about that, but I want to hear other folks' definitions. Great. Dallas, let's go to you next. You work on climate and indigenous rights um, and so many other issues. What does that term transformative justice mean to you? I think that it really means it is based on relationship. I think that too often we forget the relationship to those around us and those who we are in community with. And so I think that the idea of transformative justice really recognizes that process of how are we building community? How do we stay within community? And how do we actually um, come to rectify the harm that has happened within that community? So that's why that's the, that's the best way I could, that's how I say it, see it. Mariah, uh, let's jump to you next. What does it mean for you when you hear those words, transformative justice? Um, when I think about transformative justice, I think about coming at harm from a, a standpoint of care and accountability. So first of all, acknowledging that none of us is disposable um, and um, asking questions about what we need to do in order to ensure harm doesn't take place again and that we can heal from the harm that has transpired. So what is a perpetrator of, of a violence of some kind um, need in order to ensure that they don't you know, perpetrate a similar harm in the future? And what is a, a survivor of harm need to, in order to heal from what has happened to them? Sorry, my cat is trying to jump in the frame. Um, and so I think this, it's really important and I'm really glad that you all discussed the way that this is also scalable to thinking about how this can affect, affect policy making as well, not just interpersonal forms of harm. So how do we not only um, address crises or address harm that's happening in the present, but transform the underlying conditions that gave rise to that in the first place in our policy making? And finally, not last but not least, Reverend uh, Dr. Liz Theo Harris, your work on the Poor People's Campaign is really broad. I imagine the issue of transformative justice comes up quite a bit. Indeed. And so thanks so much for having me here. And it's, it's great to be in conversation with this powerful group of leaders um, in, in the Poor People's Campaign work. In, in we're seeing the connections and we're trying to come together and build a fusion movement of people across all the lines that divide us for a transformative justice movement. Right. Um, uh, so we have a number of sayings in our work, and I think they kind of speak to what transformative justice is. Uh, one is that when we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. This idea that that how a society cares for those on the margins, those who have been had a history of oppression, a history of poverty, a history of systemic racism, how if 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 folks are organized, their needs and their demands are at the absolute center of our policies, of our structures, of our community life, of our personal relationships that that indeed folks uh, come up uh, and everybody uh, benefits from that. A another that, that we talk about is everybody in, nobody out, right? That, that we all have a right to live, that we all have a right to thrive and dream and love, and, and, that, and that this is what a, a movement, a society that, that centers uh, justice, that centers uh, the lives and the livelihoods of absolutely everybody. And that means taking special protections and special uh, uh, lifting up of, of, of groups that have a history of, of uh, you know, systemic racism, white supremacy, and all of the injustices that have really wreaked havoc on, on millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people across this country and, and billions across the world.
So it seems as though, so judging from what everyone has said, this is a an approach to justice that's not punitive, that involves accountability, that doesn't leave people out. Um, and yet, when we look at the how uh, the establishment tackles big problems today, it usually is from a, a, a punishment approach, a punitive approach, uh, tackling the end uh, result rather than looking at the root causes. Uh, you know, let's uh, cut this person off from society, or let's cut this thing off from from where we you know and, and and not look at it holistically so amanda how you know do you do you see sort of incremental reforms as kind of being the enemy of transformative justice if you will so for me i think about it it's not so much the pace of reforms kind of like incremental or revolution it's about the direction <laughs> um you know so so i'm just making i think that there's been a lot of deep thinking about what does it mean to do abolitionist reforms or non-reformist reforms? Um, you know, knowing that there needs to be harm reduction in the here and now. Um, that, you know, there are people who are trapped in systems, and there, you know, think changes that we need to make. But we need to make sure that the changes that we make are not things that we're going to have to tear down, <laughs> you know, ten or twenty years ago, uh, ten or twenty years from now. And so, making sure that we are moving from a place of um, abolition as we fight for. Um, you know, transforming these systems. And so for us at the Detroit Justice Center, we have, you know, really prompted um, people and listened to people who are reimagining, you know, what it means to have a just city um, and what that's going to mean in terms of our budgets and what we need to take money out of and invest into. And so we have held, held things like youth design summits where we've asked young people and sp instead of spending half a billion dollars on a new jail in Detroit, what could we build instead that would make you feel safe and valued and empowered? And these young people say things like, you know, we want a mental health spa. And they said, you know, they had designed it down to what would be the most soothing paint colors on the walls. It's a place to go where you could just um, talk through whatever is making you anxious um, and find some ease. They said, pay our teachers. Um, you know, we want transit that will get us safely from one side of the city to the other fix the water pipes in our schools, get the black mold out of our schools. Um, people know that these are the types of investments um, that lead to true deep safety um, and you know, that we need to stop feeding the beast um, when it comes to putting you know, another dime into policing or incarceration or things that have only failed our communities. You know, I'm going to just ask our panelists to jump in. I know that all of you have so much to say. So whoever wants to sort of piggyback on what Amanda was just saying, just jump on in. Sure, I'll go for it if, if, if I may. Um, I'm really glad Amanda touched on um, the kinds of investments and kind of community visioning that need to happen in order to make our communities truly safe. Because I think the really harmful thing about incremental reform is not the pace, as Amanda also said, but our focus on reforming the criminal justice system as the, as the center of our energies. When really we need to be thinking um, more about the other drains in our communities that inform our public health and our public safety. So instead of tinkering around with what our use of force policies are within our police department, what kinds of um, systems are available within our courts for accountability. Um, instead of using our energies there, actually getting out into the community and thinking about what sorts of investments will prevent harm from happening in the first place, prevent someone from getting to the point where they have to sell drugs or they have to um, steal in order to feed their children to the point where they have a mental health crisis that leads them then to have an inter interaction with the police. And so um, thinking about uh, the way that we can shift our focus away from you know, tinkering with these small things within our existing criminal justice system and instead uh, investing in our communities such that our the criminal justice system as we know it is, is, is um, less central to people's lives and how do we um, address harm. If I, I may add to that, I, you know, there are some, there are many elements of the, of restorative justice that is grounded in indigenous practice and life ways and not just indigenous peoples from the Americas by indigenous peoples from all across the globe, you know, for land, you know, localized land-based communities and cultures have had found, have, have had to discover and, and employ different methodologies of how to live in relationship with one another, how to um, address conflict and how to heal from conflict and how to address trauma and heal from trauma. And one, you know, although all these cultures are different as uh, you know, there are, there are many different ways of practice. But what I think is 
a key aspect in this is that restorative justice is not a program, is not a project that is, um, that is you know, that it lives in isolation by itself, but is very much a very, a, a, a critical aspect of the culture itself, of the community itself. And I think that I, I just going off of what folks say, like it's a, I guess it's a, it's a setup question to say, oh, what do you, do you want incremental or do you want, is it, so it has to be tomorrow, but actually that's not the issue. It's like, like how, where is justice housed within our culture? How do we talk about it is really the key factor here. So um, just that's what comes to mind here in all the, the discussion so far. Yeah, I'm also really appreciating the the conversation and and thinking about um, that we have to move from a place of of scarcity of thinking this is as good as it gets that things have to be this way that there's no other way to organize that of course the cops are there to protect us um, and the banks are there to do the right thing to to a, a place where we actually see that we're living in a world of beautiful abundance. Um, that it does not have to be this way, that justice is possible and in fact needed and necessary and, and folks are gonna help usher in this kind of transformative justice, right? So, you know, again, if, if, we, if we see that the kind of pandemic was this portal into the injustices, the fissures that existed already in society and only kind of shined a light on them and deepened them, um, you know, I think what we saw in the first months of the pandemic was, uh, you know, the, Wall Street being bailed out uh, by the Federal Reserve, the cops getting more money to be able to police movement for Black Lives protests, and and families, 140 million of whom were poor before the pandemic, and more many more that that fell into economic insecurity, uh, being left to fend for ourselves, and 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 that's that speaks to the kind of way that we deal with these issues, restorative justice, transformative justice, and, and the kind of funding of cops and the military and the kind of policing and dividing of our communities, when it does not have to be this way. What we saw was that there was enough resources to bail out, not just Wall Street, not just the cops, but to, to lift from the bottom. It, it, it did not benefit our society to have the kind of inequality, racism, um, injustice, environmental chaos that that has now become kind of structured right to the very core. And so, so I think when we're when we're talk about kind of transformative change and and how we get there, it is about direction. It's are we on the right train? Are we going the right way? Um, have we gone back into history to look forward into the future? And it's coming from a place that it does not have to be this way. It, this is not as good as it gets. And we do not have to settle for injustice when, when the people and the earth um, demand justice. I, I wanna throw out a couple of points before we get to some audience questions. Um, it seems as though a transformative justice approach is definitely a holistic one that involves following to the end point. Well, what's, what is the vision of what we want in the world and then working backwards to there. And it's also a way to approach justice that's not fear-based. So, so much of our current misinformed, misguided ways of solving problems create more problems because they're based in fear. And usually it's fear of of, of what humans are, ourselves are capable of, right? Let's lock up this person because so they don't commit another crime rather than what might have led them to commit a crime and why should we be writing off a whole person, et cetera. So uh, these seem to be some themes, this needing this transformative, this vision of what we wanna see in the world. And I really love Dallas, what you were saying about how so much of this is rooted in indigenous um, uh, traditions that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can look at what cultures have already figured out in terms of relationships with one another and relationships with our environment. Um, so Amanda, I'll throw it back to you since we started with you. How does that then get trans, how does that get implemented in a practical way? Because of course, when communities present these issues, um, they get distilled and you know reduced to, oh, well, you just wanna defund the police. So you're anti-police. And so you see rising crime, that's because you were against the police. And so the police have held back from enforcing um, the laws. And, 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 you know, I mean, you get these really, really destructive and, and, and angry pushbacks to calls for transformative justice. So how does it practically implement? 
Yeah, um, I want to lift up the fact that we have seen, you know, such powerful wins by local organizers in the past year and a half. So I would say, while people have been busy, you know, de debating whether defund the police is the right, uh, you know, semantic choice, organizers have been busy redistributing funds. Um, there have been powerful victories to direct money away from police departments in places like Seattle um, that we can all learn from. Um, and so I you know, would say that it's not about starting from scratch. Um, you know, like Dallas has said, there are very long wisdom traditions to draw upon and very real experiments that people are doing at the local level that will start to get us to the place that we need to be in terms of making policing obsolete. Um, I think of organizations like Detroit Heals Detroit Detroit, um, which is a group of young people here in Detroit who come together to do weekly healing circles um, with each other. And they recognize that, you know, often it is unaddressed trauma that leads people, um, you know, to, to harm and to violence. And if we can come together as young people and figure out um, how to care for each other, um, those are the types of things that can prevent harm, you know, down the line. And so we have all sorts of ways that people are building, are practicing restorative justice, are skilling up in how to de-escalate harm. And so we can start and learn from these experiments that are already happening. Um, I think it's really important to know that abolition is not something that's this pie in the sky out there idea, but something that people are practicing in the here and now. And it's just about building on those experiments and directing resources towards them. Um, I loved that Reverend Dr. Theo Harris talked about the abundance that we have. You know, we spend $80 billion a year on prisons in this country. It's $1.2 trillion when you total up the impact in other systems like housing and foster care. That's incredible abundance that right now is being directed towards people's demise and should be redirected towards helping people flourish. And actually, we've had a couple of questions come in that I'll go to from our audience that do speak to exactly that resources, the question of resources. So Ken Hill asks, can the panelists speak to how resources spent, quote unquote, at the bottom are more efficient at transforming society slash lives? Anyone? So I, I love this question and, and can think uh, about a bunch of examples, just like Amanda was 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 using, you know, in that kind of um, so yes, it, oh, since 9-11, you know, we've, we've spent uh, $21 trillion in policing and deportation and detention in war, right? Um, and when we imagine what $21 trillion could do if we invested it in, especially if we invested it into communities from the bottom up, right? If we were tomorrow to raise uh, the living wage, the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which is, is actually not enough even itself. But if we were to do it, we would bring more than $300 billion brought into the community, right? That would help small businesses. That would help the bodega across the street from where I live. That would, that would mean more resources, you know, flowing amongst not just poor and low income people, but amongst everybody. Um, you know, when for every dollar spent, on early childhood programs, um, education and, and other kind of programs, programs like Head Start and Universal Pre-K. Um, every dollar we spend saves seven dollars um, of the future of, of instead putting that money into the police and into, and I love this framing, into people's demise, right? Um, uh, so thank you for that framing, Amanda. That's beautiful. I'm going to keep on using it. I, I will, as a preacher, I will, I will reference you for it. Um, and then eventually it'll become other people's. Um, but, but anyways, I just, it, like we have all of these examples, right? Um, every dollar, every job created to, for climate resilience, um, for, for caring for this earth and not destroying it through fossil fuels and other, other pieces uh, that those jobs go so much farther than military jobs and fossil fuel jobs, right? In terms of actually uh, lifting up communities and, and they're cheaper, right? It's not that we're paying people less for them, but, but the money um, uh, invested in, in decent, good jobs, green jobs actually um, redounds um, to the benefit of all. And, and I think just over and over again, we have these examples. Um, that indeed, when you invest in in communities and in people and in and folks that are are struggling against injustice, that that this is actually the way that you build up community. 
And I'll just throw my two cents into that. I mean, right now there's this big debate, right, in Congress around the Build Back Better agenda. And just a few months ago, uh, families with children started getting their child tax credits uh, refunds. And already you saw poverty levels fall. Uh, studies found that just by infusing a very modest amount of cash into the hands of families uh, who are the you know who, who are working families, you can immediately see this this very tangible drop in food insecurity and drop in in um, in child poverty and 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 poverty in general. So that's you know there, there's so much evidence of that. Um, Tony, another of our audience, asks: the Earth already has a hundred and seventy five percent deficit over its regenerative bio capacity. 140% of that is in the US and Europe, with only, which has only 10% of the world's population. How do you put that in context with justice? So I guess this is a question around energy consumption and the fact that, you know, we often hear from the naysayers that it's, it's there's too many people on the planet. And, and if we want to address uh, climate change or the environment, we have to address the overpopulation, um, the implication being that there's maybe too many black and brown babies being born in other parts of the world. But of course, we know resources are, are sucked up disproportionately. So how do we put that in context with justice? Uh, I can uh, try to take a, um, a swing at that one. First of all, I don't know what those numbers mean because it, I don't, <laughs> they don't make, like, my head's like, oh, I can't process numbers well. Um, but numbers I can shoot back, uh, uh, throw back at, at folks is um, 80% of the world's biodiversity is in the hands and controlled or managed by indigenous communities across the globe, predominantly in the global South. You know, so you have a very small percentage of, of the human population that is caring for and managing over 80% of our biodiversity on this planet. So that's one reason why it's absolutely essential that we create safeguards and processes that uphold and recognize the rights of those indigenous communities, whether they're in Africa, whether they're in South America, whether they're in the global north, wherever it may be, we've demonstrated that by acknowledging indigenous rights, you're able to protect the planet as well as build a just society that acknowledges the humanity of people of color and other uh, uh, other communities. Um, I think that, and this might be tangential, but you know, the the trick that we've all been sold here is that the solution to the problem is up to you the individual it's up to us as individuals to fix the the, the problem of the climate i mean that's been peddled by the oil and gas industry billions of dollars have been put into this 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 idea that as long as you take responsibility then that's how we're going to solve the climate change the climate crisis and that's not restorative, that's not transformative whatsoever. It's putting blame on the individual you without just uh, while putting complete blinders on the greater system that has created the harm. Well, and it has, um, it limits the ability for us to actually have good solid conversation as community about how are we actually making a change that is for the better of the next seven generations of life. And so I think that's something that really plays into it. I mean, that really plays into how the, the most uh, developed countries of the world say, oh, well, we're only going to do our part if India and, and China and um, South Africa, and if they step up. And it really just puts the pressure on them saying, well, it's their fault, while completely putting blinders on the whole, how the whole system is rigged. I want to make space for Mariah to jump in here. Uh, I think you might be the youngest person on the panel, uh, but also somebody who has, I mean, achieved incredible. You were elected county commissioner in 2018 at the age of 26. So you're clearly not one to rest on your laurels. You're, you've taken action. You've taken responsibility. How are you? What are you thinking about as we're having these conversations in 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 how transformative justice? is a framework for change that, that you're involved in? Um, I did want to um, briefly, you know, as a person that's like kind of young, I'm getting, I'm getting out of that, <laughs> you know, every day, I'm getting farther and farther. But 
as I come in, I had come into this work with a strong connection to youth and try to keep that alive in the work that I do and staying in touch with young people, connecting with young people in my district in order to understand whether and how their needs are being served and how we can transform existing systems in order to ensure that those young people have um, a good future. Um, a lot of our conversations around safety in our community also revolve around youth development and the development of strong leaders and setting people up to not only have economic security, which is very much linked to um, personal prosperity of other kinds of spiritual kinds of social kinds, but um, ensuring that they ha are uh, well-rounded folks in order to, um, you know, have healthy interpersonal relationships to not feel drawn into things like community violence and gangs that we're seeing a lot of, um, in the community where I serve. And so to also kind of go back to the previous question with regards to how um, consumption and climate relate to justice, I wanted to uh, bring up a very specific example of how we're addressing those things together um, in the community where I serve. So I did a lot of research um, into various other ways of addressing public safety in our community through investments of, of various kinds. And in um, the book, um, Palaces for the People by Eric, Eric Klinenberg, he talks about how Beautiful communities are communities that people respect and uh, join in together to have a stronger sense of community socially because they gather in public spaces like parks or like gardens or libraries. If there, if those kinds of social infrastructure are invested in, as well, we're thinking about how the young people in our community don't have a, a meaningful place to gain a sense of community and and a sense of self. Um, and so they're being driven into, you know, joining gangs or becoming involved in community violence. Um, they're also drawn to it because you can make money selling drugs. So you can make money as a part of organized crime. So um, that financial draw is, is a huge driver of, of, of youth violence in our community as well. And then thinking about the fact as well that in, during the pandemic, uh, food assistance has been the main form of aid that we as a local government have distributed to uh, people across our city. So we're taking you know, food that was grown somewhere else and then shipped to a factory to get canned and then shipped to Kroger to get sold and Kroger can't sell it. So then they take it over to the food bank and then the food bank brings it to the church and then the church distributes it to the people. How this system uh, is so wasteful in terms of expenditure of resources um, that are ultimately driving our climate crisis with the burning of fossil fuels, um, to make this all happen. And so putting together all of this, you know, um, what's driving crime in our neighborhood, as well as attention to the way that our food, our, our food systems are driving climate change, we've come up with the idea of having community gardens by transforming blighted properties in our district into, you know, tearing down abandoned buildings that are being used for people to shoot up or hide if they're running from the cops and turn them into places where people can collectively gather to learn how to grow food so that not only are we addressing the immediate crisis of the pandemic of food insecurity, but also letting people leave with the skills they need to ensure food security for their families for the future. And also paying young people who are getting involved in gangs to come work in the garden so that we're giving them a positive place to build a sense of self, to build a sense of community. And so um, I think that it's really important for us to look at, I'm really glad this question got asked because it's really important for us to look at the relationship between climate and, um, and justice. And there are really concrete ways that these can be addressed at the local level through investing in sustainable and sovereign uh, food systems that uh, disrupt um, the waste that we currently have with how we eat and how we connect or don't connect with the land. Well, I'm really, really loving this panel so far. I want to jump to one more uh, question. Lori asks, um, how can raising the minimum wage not ultimately impact the cost of goods and services? So you get inflation and the higher wages are then used up from the higher cost of goods and services. I suppose this is the, the standard pushback against, uh, well, if we raise the minimum wage, it's going to be a job killer. This is the pushback that we get from the establishment. Um, I feel like we've all addressed that a little bit, but but maybe uh, it might be good to get a talking point response to that question that often comes up. If you raise the minimum wage, won't it just you know, apparently make every everything worse? <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, yeah. uh, we, we do a lot of organizing with the Fight for 15 and others that are, are uh, have been for a long time um, raising the alarm at the fact that that we live in a nation that um, if you're working full time and making the current minimum wage, you 
there's not a town, a county, a, a city anywhere in this country that you can afford to even just rent a two bedroom apartment. And, and that, that should raise some pretty significant concerns about the kind of uh, havoc that, that low wages are, are, are having on, on our communities. But, but indeed, I mean, there, there is this kind of common pushback. Um, it usually comes from the Chamber of Commerce and, and from big companies, even if then we kind of uh, digest it in our own, our, our own selves. Um, and, we internalize and, it. And, and we do. And, um, and I think there's a couple of things that go on. I mean, one is that in the cities, you know, if we're going to talk about Seattle, for instance, um, uh, that raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour in New York City, where I live, um, that has a minimum wage of $15 an hour and, and growing, uh, there, there hasn't been a one-to-one -one ratio of you raise the wages and there's, you know, massive cost, uh, you know, price jumps and inflation. It's just, uh, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, and so it's not that there aren't instances of things going up and if, you know, anyways, I'm, I'm not an economist, um, but, but, but the reality is, is if you look at the examples where this has happened, um, uh, uh, that that the kind of doom and gloom that we hear about um, and the kind of end of the world that we're approaching if we were to to raise wages it has not happened has not become a reality um, and and part of that is again that that when you raise people's wages um, folks are able to afford more um, and right now we have to have a, a bigger balance of power um, you know, again, who who does not want us to be raising wages are those um, corporations that are are really benefiting from uh, and and currently a lot of those costs are are hidden, right? So the fact that Walmart, when they hire workers, trains them how to access food stamps and SNAP benefits, um, that's not something we talk about, right? So the cost, the added cost, that basically uh, the the public, you know, is is paying for the low wages that Walmart is pay, is is paying its workers. Um, that that somehow doesn't that kind of crisis isn't in our conversation. But but when we dare to to have uh, fast food workers demanding fifteen dollars an hour, then the response is um, well that's going to be the end of the world. Um, and, and and yet it hasn't been uh, in the places that have done it. So so there. And I think the the in some ways the the last point I'll make because I don't need to go on too much, but is is can we imagine uh, a, a world where there isn't this kind of inequality? You know, and 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 do we believe that people, all all people, deserve to thrive in this society? You know, so Senator Joe Manchin out of West Virginia is one of the the key people that is blocking um, raising the the wages. Um, in West Virginia, you would have to make $23.50 an hour to be able to have a, a living wage. Um, and yet he is very proud of saying that, that he would never go higher than $11 an hour. And he sounds very reasonable and he sounds very concerned about the economy and concerned about the people. But the reality is, is denying the people of his state and of this nation of living wages is is enacting violence on communities, and, and, and it is doing that, um, and it has that impact. Um, and so he can be very measured in the way he talks about it. Um, but but it, but the effects, the devastating effects. I mean, what we saw in the pandemic and before are the study after study about the suicide rates amongst low wage workers, about about the the you know homelessness, the the kids being taken away, the you know all of the that kind of devastation that we have just gotten used to dealing with in our society um, as a counter to, to talking about the perils of actually, you know, lifting up people um, and paying them what they deserve and need. I feel like we have uh, a lot of work to be done on the sort of narrative front. Uh, maybe I'm biased as a journalist uh, picking up on that, but uh, do we need a cultural shift, right, in how we approach these things? Because it is... Uh, we're bombarded with messages. We internalize those messages. And then when communities talk about putting money, investing money into societies, um, many of us, not us here in this room today, but, uh, but the general public tend to 
parrot what they hear the pundits say in the pages of the Washington Post because we've internalized these capitalist frameworks and mindsets. Um, Dallas, you're someone who does a lot of cultural work. And in fact, I really want to hear about the 1491s <laughs> and, and how you use comedy as a tool as well. But, but let's, you know, how do we how do we have a cultural mind shift toward transformative justice framing for the problems in our world? I, I think, you. I mean, within that are some really great points within the question uh, that should be elevated. This idea, the need to tell a different story, right? The dominant narrative has has been laid um, literally on the backs of black and brown indigenous peoples of this country, the, the narrative of this country. Um, and in order for us to really have a cultural shift, we have to start uplifting those uh, the other stories of, of to find a different way to talk about where we are going, because that's what a story, you know, you sit down with your children, right? And, you, and they want to ask you, well, tell me a story, a, a fable, or tell any kind of story. There's always a beginning, middle, and end. And there's always a, a goal in sight. And what we are talking about right now, when we're talking about transformative justice, is that we are trying to create a whole new story. Or it, actually, we're not, that's, we're not trying to create a whole new story. The story has already been there. But what we are going up against is a dominant narrative that has dictated that those that that the that the wants and whims of the many must be sacrificed so that the few can survive and, and thrive. And you know that's the quintessential capitalist dream. That's the quintessential capital uh, capitalist story. And we're pushing back against that. So I think any times we are able to subvert that, it's amazing to see whether that's in uh, different forms of culture, whether it's in music and films or in books. I think that we are seeing that across this country in the past uh, in the past few years, a cultural shift because we are taking over the narrative, right? And for example, the the work that ha all the um, mobilizations around Black Lives Matter, and the and the and pushing back and challenging the core narrative of white supremacy in this country, was is is not only essential, but is vital for the future of this planet for us to challenge that. And uh, so that's just a great example where through action, through intention and through just amazing storytelling, like we are we are really trying to transform the world that, that is around us. Can I jump in here, Sonali? Please. Yes, yeah, so I was about um, to call on you. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say um, this has been a realization on the part of our, our work at DJC, the Detroit Justice Center, is how important the narrative shifting work is. And we actually just launched a podcast this week called Freedom Dreams, um, where we are, the tagline is, we believe another world is possible and we're talking to the people who are building it. Um, I think it is so important that people get examples of what people are making possible. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna talk with people like the um, women who led the organizing campaign in Atlanta to uh, empty the Atlanta city jail um, and now they're working to open a center for wellness and freedom. Um, and so many people need to know that it's possible to shut down your city jail by things like ending cash bail, breaking contracts with ICE, creating diversion programs. There's a model here um, for you know, meeting people's needs in other ways and imagining how could we reinvest money in things like centers for wellness and freedom. So a big shout out to Women on the Rise and others who led that campaign. Um, we're lifting up the work of people who are creating community land trust um, and doing the work of land sovereignty and food sovereignty, like Mariah talked about um, you know, so beautifully. Um, we're talking to people who are creating local land funds so that people can buy back um, land so that they actually are able to hold on to it for generations to come. Um, we're talking to people who are doing participatory budgeting at the local level to shift money away from police departments and into people's budgets um, and invest in things that people know will keep them safe. And so there are just so many examples and stories out there um, that are instructive when it comes to helping people to understand how bold we can be in our demands, how much we can demand. Um, and so I think that we can learn from each other um, because that type of thing, it is contagious, you know, to, to, to know that we can be courageous and we can demand everything that we deserve. Um, we're, we're getting some more questions and there's a theme. I think a lot of our audience is sort of wondering 
how do we respond to those who come at our movements from a place of fear? So there's one question of what do you say to folks who are scared of defunding police? This is a question from Matt. What community focused initiatives do you see working? And I'll throw that out there. And, and on um, also another uh person named Kat asks, how do we respond to action that is so big and regressive? For example, the governor of Alabama signing a bill to use $1.3 billion of COVID relief funds to renovate and build more prisons. Um, you know, and so I think these are, these are good questions because we often hear them. This maybe goes right back into this question of narrative shifting and cultural shifting. But um, there's just, there, there's so much fear mongering, right? Around um, solutions. So does anyone want to jump in on, you know, how do you respond to folks who are scared of defunding police? I'd love to take that one um, because I have, I, I feel like I, I, I goofed in spending a lot of my early time um, in channeling energy from the uprisings last summer into arguing with people that are skeptical. Whereas there's a lot of people who aren't a part of the conversation at all, who no one is asking about what solutions they'd like to see in their communities. And when you go talk to them, frameworks like defund actually make a lot of sense. So in the wake of a spree of shootings that happened in my community um, in the springtime, there were a series of town halls and cookouts and barbecues and uh, you know, community car washes to raise money for youth programs that I, I started going to. And these are people who were otherwise very civically engaged, whatever, whatsoever. People who had been recently incarcerated themselves, had, you know, were, were had close ties to folks that were involved in gangs and involved in community violence and who no one was asking what sort of solutions would make their community safer. And when you go talk to them, folks who maybe have not even heard of abolition or the, or the words defund, when you go talk to them and tell them how much money our city spends on the criminal justice system, about 40% of the $300 million that we allocate every year, their minds are blown because they they will tell you straight up that they want money for our community centers. They want money for youth development. They want money for workforce development. Um, they want money for housing and for healthcare. More so than what they don't want, they will tell you very clearly what they do want. And when you explain to them that that money that could be spent over there on the things that they need are actually being spent on policing and incarceration, um, they get mad real quick. And so I would tell anyone that's like, well, what do we do about folks that are very skeptical of this framework? It's like, well, who are you talking to that isn't in this conversation, who hasn't been in this conversation previously? And what are they asking for? Because oftentimes, very rarely will you hear someone say, oh, yeah, we need more policing. They'll tell you about housing. They'll tell you about healthcare if you go ask them. But so few people do. Um, there's a one question. Does anyone on today's panel, this is from Rebecca, does anyone on today's panel have relationships with cooperative housing or worker owned cooperatives? I know that uh, we had some mention of community land trust, but I believe this is different cooperative housing and worker owned cooperatives, um, which speaks to a sort of like, you know, potential path for transformative justice um, approaches to, to solving problems. Anyone? I'm happy to speak to that some. Yeah, so uh, part of our economic equity practice work um, at Detroit Justice Center is to support um, worker-owned cooperatives in the city. And so um, we have partnered with organizations like the Detroit Community Wealth Fund um, and others to put on a co-op academy um, that runs over the course of several weeks. And, and actually, Amanda, um, how, do you, how do you even explain to somebody who doesn't really mm -hmm. know how these things work, what is a worker co-op? Yeah. Um, so the, the idea of a worker owned cooperative is really getting at, um, you know, something that's thought of as solidarity um, economics or cooperative economics. And these are real alternatives to the capitalist system, where if you have a traditional business set up um, where you have um, workers and owners and it's the owners who get to decide, um, you know, uh, how revenue is shared, um, how profits are shared. The beauty of a worker-owned cooperative is that, you know, everyone who is a worker is also an owner and also gets to make decisions about, um, you know, where, where revenue should go, how profit sharing should work. Um, and so a lot of this work is about how to co-govern. Um, you know, an enterprise together. Um, and so it, it's a beautiful um, exercise in actual democracy. <laughs> um, you know, oftentimes it's really hard, um, but it's really good practice as well in figuring out 
um, how to govern something together. So um, to give some examples, um, we have been honored to support, um, you know, businesses that have come out of this co-op academy that is all about, you know, kind of showing people, here's how to set it up legally. Here's a legal framework that you need to do if you want to you know, have a cooperatively owned business. Here's how to govern this together. Um, and so we have supported um, a number of Black woman-owned um, businesses. Um, there's a, a new Black woman-owned um, garden center here in Detroit um, that is cooperatively owned. I could give you know, all sorts of examples. Um, but it is a really powerful um, you know, way to create um, you know, uh, structures that are alternatives to capitalism that are less exploitative, where people who are doing the work actually get to decide the conditions of that work. Um, and, and so it's certainly a model that people should be looking at. We've been looking at what does it take for a city to really support an ecosystem of co-ops? Um, and so we see our tiny part at DJC is providing some legal support for these, but it also comes down to, you know, accessing funding um, for startup costs for businesses. Um, you know, it's, it's a quite complicated thing, but there are more and more uh, people out there experimenting with this. I love the idea of a worker uh, co-op academy. I mean, every city should have that because I imagine there's people who have the ideas but don't know where to start. Yeah. Um, any Anyone else want to jump in on, on that at all? Um, or how we might see worker co-ops as part of a transformative justice framework? Um, one I, I, oh, sorry, go, go for it, Dallas. No, uh, I just, like, it's actually can, this plus the comment, the question before around, like, how kind of, because that comes up all the time, right? Like, I talking to my own family. My mom says, well, how are you going to do that? Like, it's a challenge that we all experience. And, you know, there's a phrase that's now become more popular, but I always love it is the idea that we are getting to a place where we, we want to encourage, we have to lovingly allow ourselves to radically imagine a future that is healthy for all of us, that is better for what we have than what we have now. And because right now in the moment, we're living within the dreams of those in power. And oftentimes those dreams are nightmares for our communities, full of violence, full of, of fear and insecurities. And so like the first step is getting our folks together in space to get our folks to our communities together to allow to have the conversation, just allow ourselves to have the conversation about what, what could we be doing different? And I think that's where the roadblock is, is because we don't even allow ourselves to dream like with worker co-ops or our living co-ops or any kind of alternative way to be in community. And, and when we encounter these, these, these things, they, they sound so foreign, like, Oh, what is a co-op? Oh, that sounds like something that I don't want to be a part of that, but it's just because we are not allowing ourselves that freedom to dream. And I mean, that's really what, like what I come across all the time. And so like the first step in my path that I, that I've encouraged folks is like, that's, it's kind of like why I always hear folks when you have a problem or there's a problem in your community, like organize, like work, build community and, and, and join a group. And the, the goal there is to dream together, right? To, to to have the conversation about what alternatives are before you. And if you don't know that amongst yourselves, there are others out there who are willing to build that with you. So I, that that's just all this is like bringing that up to bringing that up in my mind. Love it. Um, we have another question from uh, Rebecca and Nunu. Where can we find resources that explain some of these talking points for more people to feel confident sharing these ideas? Um, I'll jump in and say, yes, magazine, get, get a subscription for, you know, for, for your friends, the holidays are coming up, share, share the gift of yes, because that's the solutions from a transformative justice framework is, is often what we tackle. I believe the video of this panel will eventually be available. Um, I think if folks register, um, they'll get the link to the video of this panel and maybe you can share it, but I'll throw it out to the, our panelists as well, um, books that you can recommend or other resources. And maybe Amanda, you could even throw out where that uh, co-op academy is, you know, where people can find out more about it and see if they can start something like that in their community. Sure. So I think that there's information about the co-op academy on our website at the Detroit Justice Center, um, also on the Detroit Community Wealth Funds uh, website. Uh, some things, some resources that come to mind for me, uh, there are so many. So, um, you know, I would say there's transformharm.org, I believe, and it has all sorts of 
toolkits um, for people who might want to do work locally around restorative justice or transformative justice, um, conflict resolution, uh, you know, mediation, um, you know, real, real toolkits for people to use to put this into practice. Um, there's interrupting criminalization um, out of Barnard that has done a lot of work um, to help us you know, um, think about how do we interrupt, um, you know, the, the criminal legal system and build something else instead that could look more restorative. Um, a book that I am reading now and loving is Derricka Purnell's new book, Becoming Abolitionist. Um, and she talks about her own journey in going from thinking that abolition was something that, you know, wasn't for her, was maybe the, the purview of white leftists who weren't familiar with day-to-day -day violence. Um, and to re and to ultimately become disenchanted with police reform and to fully embrace abolition as the only viable way forward. And so I think that it's a real entryway for people who are maybe on a journey when it comes to um, embracing um, abolition or transformative justice. Those are a few that I would start with. Anyone else want to throw out any? Uh... Sure. Resources? Yeah. To that, I would add uh, Miriam Cabo's new book, uh, We Do This Till We Free Us, a lot of really accessible essays about transformative justice, um, both in terms of um, longer term visions and then practically what we can do now to enact abolition through the way we hold people to account and build community um, today. I also really love the website One Million Experiments, um, where they catalog a number of, of um, initiatives to keep people safe without relying on the state um, in cities around the country and around the country and around the world. So anything from, anything from community fridges to various projects um, that are community-based that help people access their, secure their basic needs and, you know, to empower, as Liz said, I love, I love this, lift from the bottom, you know, I love that idea, to lift from the bottom in our communities. And so if you need a daily dose of inspiration for what folks are working on in cities around the world um, with regards to um, community-based uh, violence interventions and preventative um, programming, uh, one million experiments is the name of the website. I, I would en encourage folks to learn more about the connections of how climate justice is, is interlinked with all these other fights. Um, the Climate Justice Alliance is a great resource and a, a tremendous organization, a an alliance of frontline communities who are fighting to make this world a better place for their for their communities, but also for everybody on this planet. So, uh, Climate Justice Alliance, they are online. You can check them out. And I might jump in about, um, I mean, I, I love all of these resources. And um, if folks are interested in, in some of how these issues are playing out in states and, and counties across the country, we on the Poor People's Campaign website have a whole series of fact sheets um, that both explain some of the issues that communities are facing, but always have a section. Uh, we, we have a saying in our work where, we're not interested in just cursing the darkness, but but shining kind of an agenda and demands and and a light on what's possible and these big bold solutions. And so, you know, uh, we we often will say, you know, this state, you know, spent this much on police, this much on military, and if that money had been invested in education, it could have you know helped thousands of schools. If it had been invested in food programs, it could have fed millions of people, you know, just, and and so anyways, I, I really encourage folks to check out um, the set of fact sheets that are on our um, uh, website, as well as look at the National Priorities Projects, which I think is does a really good job of, of kind of also kind of putting out some talking points about how it does not have to be this way and we could do things differently. And, and this is how some people are, but then also, you know, gives you some of those facts and figures as well as those those powerful stories and testimonies. So um, I would just add those as well. Great, I hope uh, folks in our audience are taking notes like I am. There's some wonderful suggestions here. We have a, just under 10 minutes left. And I wanted to sort of uh, ask our panelists to, to close with the question that often gets asked whenever people are inspired by work of others, which is that, the work is big, and as this panel has concluded, it's interconnected, right? So many different aspects of our struggles are linked to one another. Racial justice linked to environmental justice, uh, power, you know, solving poverty linked to, to the climate crisis, to biodiversity, they, they are all linked. Um, so making these linkages import, is important, but it can also then seem so daunting, and there's you know, a few people doing a lot 
and far too many people not doing enough. And I know that often people feel overwhelmed with where do I start? How do I fit into to this, this big ecosystem of ideas and actions and issues? So what do you say to inspire an individual who might be listening and watching this panel now, who's inspired by you, but just doesn't know where to go and start? Anyone? Something that I was told when I was a young person that has always resonated with me and always like held me a lot in difficult times is the idea that you know our, our, our role in the world is finding the intersection between what the world needs and our vocation and our, our passion and our interests. And so I think that letting folks find comfort and strength and confidence in what their particular lane is as a means of connecting with movements. If you are, as you know, Dallas was talking about storytelling, if you are a beautiful poet, putting that in service of, of, of the movement and knowing that that is enough. Um, if you are an incredible baker, making sure that the community meeting where we're talking about uh, community-based solutions to, uh, to safety, um, make, sure you, make sure everybody's got a muffin. Uh, that could be your contribution to the movement, um, and that is enough. And so, um, you know, kind of relishing in what we bring, um, though it may be unique, it may seem niche or small, that everyone has their role to play um, by finding that intersection between what the world needs and what your calling is, um, I think can be helpful when you get a little overwhelmed by how huge some of these problems are. And maybe get a cat for comfort because I'm no, loving, I'm loving the participating like, really, yeah, you know, really panelists. Yeah. <laughs> um, who wants to jump in next? We just have about five minutes left. What do you say to inspire somebody to action? So I would say it's um, about plugging in locally. Uh, we have had such a flourishing in the past year of mutual aid efforts, um, you know, where people are really demonstrating how we can care for each other as community and also use that as a basis for political organizing and beginning to shift systems. So I would say, you know, likely if there's anything that you're inspired about today, whether it's, you know, cooperatives or budget organizing or climate work or urban farming, there's likely a local organization that is already doing this work. Um, and so finding out what, you know, what is being done and how you can plug in. And otherwise, I would really echo what Mariah is saying in terms of finding what brings you joy and putting it to use for movements, because that is how we can stay in this for the long haul. We need people who are not going to get burnt out after 18 months um, because they're doing something that feels completely frustrating and out of alignment. We need people who can be in this for decades, um, who can pass the baton on to the next generation. And so because abolition is about a whole scale shift in society, it means that there is work for everyone. You know, I, I think about the graphic designers who make our Know Your Rights <laughs> flyers as attorneys um, beautiful. Um, we, we need that. We don't need everyone to be attorneys. We need people who are going to, you know, um, bring art and design. Um, some of the most powerful work to interrupt things like the death penalty in the past few years was done by pharmacists who refused to fulfill the, the, uh, you know, the prescriptions for um, drugs that were going to kill people. So it's kind of wherever you are located in a system, there is a role for you to interrupt and to build with other people and resist. You know, just as you were both talking, it suddenly took me back to what Dallas was saying earlier, which is that we tend to put this focus on individual actions. And it made me stop and think, well, did, have we fallen into that trap by even asking that question? because we assume all of this responsibility and then do we are uh, in our movements also end up putting the onus on the individual to take action dallas do you have any wisdom on that yeah i think it's a little it's there's like two different things there because we are we're we're human beings we're individuals but we're a part of society we 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 are pack animals we love and for the most part um love being around others my wife might say otherwise she doesn't like being around other people but i do it's the idea that action is informed by intent. And I think the intention here is to build, build um, together, right. And to really build power together. Cause like really that's where we, that's, that's where power lies is, is in, is within the people. And so I think that there's a difference when you say, okay, if you buy a Prius, you're good. You're, you're making the world better. Or if you got the, the nice, um, you put in LED lights all in your house. You're okay. You're you're making the world better. There's a difference between that and hey, you're an artist. 
and you have a place in this movement. Let's let's see how your art can make this movement irresistible to others. You know, if you're a baker, if you're an organizer, if you're a good talker, if you're a singer, there's places here that will challenge the the challenge the dominant narrative. And you know, um, I'm a butcher, but one of my one of my best friends, he's a he's a big nerd. He loves reading books. He reads about a lot about string theory. I have no idea what string like. I don't. I can't act like I know it. But he really what he he told me what the other day was look we are all the, the entire reality is a song it's a it's we are made up of energy and vibrations and just imagine that each one of us are, are a single note within that larger song and when we build power together we're getting into the same wavelength we're getting into the same rhythm and that the 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 wavelength gets longer we build power together by recognizing that we're all a part of that same tomb. And so I just, I, I firmly believe, and I always love the idea that, you know, we got to build a bigger we, and um, right. every one of you, one, every one of you and every one of us can be a part of that. Well, we're out of time, Reverend Theo Harris, if you can just wrap up with your two cents and then we'll say goodbye. Yeah, I don't have much to add. There's been such beautiful um, uh, inspiration uh, and, and lessons here, but, uh, what we look at when we look at history um, and we look at the present, it's it's when movements that are led by those most impacted by injustice um, come together with people from all walks of life and and forge a future that you can't actually see yet. Um, that that's when change happens. And 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 movements aren't one policy. They're not one program. They're not one action. They're not one activity. They're the coming together of people in motion. And so it means that it needs absolutely everybody and that all gifts are welcome and needed. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that the uh, folks that were fighting apartheid in South Africa said to us and, and said, uh, especially when things seem really hard, especially when it seems that like this is too great. Well, that actually a dying mule kicks the hardest. And so what if actually we're living in a moment not that it's too big and it's too overwhelming for us to make a difference, but that we're seeing the beginnings of a mule that's dying and it's kicking really hard and it's really hurting a lot of us. But it's not that it's too big of a problem for us to solve because we're, we're on the path already to, to freedom and justice. Well, on that note, uh, inspiring note, I want to thank all of you so much, our wonderful panelists for joining us. Amanda Alexander, founding executive director of the Detroit Justice Center, Dallas Goldtooth, organizer with the Keep It in the Ground campaign of the Indigenous Environmental Network, Mariah Parker, co-host of the podcast Waiting on Reparations, and who we just heard from Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar, racial justice editor at Yes Magazine. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. And now on with the show. Thank you. Thank you, Sonalia. And I also want to just say thank you to each of you who's decided to give. There's some room. We talked a little bit earlier about this, but our board members have really stepped forward, and I'm hoping that you'll join them. Elisa Gravitz has given $2,500. There's still room in that space for those of you who have both the means and the intention to support YES for the next 25 years. There's space at the $500 level. Manolia and Eli have stepped forward again, and I'm hoping that you'll join them by giving generously to get today. And we certainly want to not leave out uh, Tanya Dawkins, who was kind enough to commit $1,000. There is room there as well. I hope you'll step forward and join us and commit to supporting the future of this organization that we believe in so deeply. It's fascinating to think about how a transformative justice approach that emerged and originated with organizers working with domestic violence victims is helping to frame solutions to the violence of climate change and address the harms of historical racial violence. It's also inspiring to see the creative ways in which today's grassroots leaders are pursuing this form of social justice. Mm -hmm. Our next performer is a mother, 
organizer, poet, and author. She spent over 15 years teaching poetry as a visionary resistance to unjust policies and practices. She is a longtime organizer whose work primarily focuses on racial justice and equity, as well as advocating for data and digital privacy rights. She was honored with a certificate of special recognition in 2018 and was named one of 100 brilliant women in AI ethics in 2021. She's the founding director of Petty Propolis, a black woman-led artist incubator. Here to share a poem she wrote specifically for us today is Tawana Petty. All you gotta do is say yes to 25 years of visionary resistance. Yes is our movement's journalistic recognizance. They say history is written by the victor and fueled by deception. But what about the storytellers who scribe our condition? Paint pictures for the voiceless, chronicle narrative of our community, plant seeds for our justice, lift up our legal luminaries, chapter out our histories and help pursue our future from abolishing caste systems to solving our plastic issue. Yes to telling our own stories through righteous indignation, to acting beyond rage, our moral obligation. Yes teaches us about climate, our hopes for the ecological, tells the stories of our horrors, pushes beyond our human ego. Whether it's African produce in Portland, or fathers on parenting leave, or the trauma post-pandemic, YES offers a guide for our relief. YES remembers the survivors, Katrina and 9-11, while pushing against the lies, the ugly dominant narratives. It is more than a magazine, it's a family affair. And should I live another 25 years, I pray that yes, will still be here. Thank you, yes. Happy anniversary. I appreciate the 25 years of journalistic integrity you have held for all of us. Thank you so much, Tawana Petty. That was truly moving. And I think that you said it very well. It's more than a magazine, it's a family affair. And we're truly honored to partner with all of you as we spring forward into our next 25 years with these values leading our way. And it's so easy to support this work. Just click the link in the chat or you can text directly to YESLOVE to 44321. And we've mentioned throughout the day that we have a matching opportunity. We want to incentivize you to stretch towards a larger gift and a deeper investment in the next 25 years of YES. This is an exciting opportunity. We are able to ma match all gifts up to $60,000. Plus we have that uh, our board challenge to um, remind you about. Our board core chair, Tanya Dawkins, has do donated $1,000 to her fund for our future. And to meet her goal, she needs 10 of you to join her at that $1,000 level. This is great. We've announced board challenges at this point to at $2,500. $1,000 and $500. We are grateful for each and every member of this community. And we want to thank some of you who've had the opportunity to give to us today. Thanks to our givers. And so I'm shifting my gaze here and I see that Ron is given. Thank you, Ron. Margaret, Margaret has given also. Tawana has given. Thank you, Tawana. And thank you, Kat. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you all so very, very much. It's so heartwarming to see so many folks who are part of this community showing up to support. Yes, thank you. Oh, remember, we're going to do the drawing for the Rad Power electric bike in a little less than an hour. So be sure you enter yourself to win by clicking the link that we're dropping for you in the chat. And now, here are a handful of other inspirational folks who have a message for you and the Yes community an opportunity that I um, have to say thank you to Zenobia that I won't take. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know like where 
or what I would be doing had I not crossed paths with her. Um, and just thinking about the continuous and thoughtful care that I have received um, in any opportunity that I've had to work with her. It's just a model for not only how editors at Yes can, you know, give all that they can to writers, but just editors everywhere. Um, I just, I just want to say thank you for just helping me get my start and being there to support me every step of the way afterwards. My wife, Marcy Westerling, and our community will always be grateful to Yes Magazine for publishing Marcy's essay seven years ago. Marcy loved Julie Notariani's illustration so much that it's featured at her grave site. Later, Julie and Yes gave permission for the image to be hung in the brand new library in Cornelius, Oregon. Marcy's friends raised the funds to name a library conference room in her honor. Many of us gathered for the grand opening by the Yes illustration. Thank you to Yes for sharing Marcy's message to the world and for all the stories that lift us up and bring us close together. See you later, alligator. Yeah, Mas Yes Magazine is, I think, the perfect place for activists, for people who are, who want to get stories that aren't corporate, that aren't influenced by big business, um, and that impact their lives. Let's do a little energy gear shift. It's time to nestle into your comfy chair, maybe grab a warm beverage. Imagine you're sitting by a warm fireplace. This is my warm fireplace <laughs> for our next conversation. I'll start by introducing Zenobia Jeffries Warfield, executive editor at Yes. Zenobia is a, an award-winning journalist and editor with 15 years of experience in the media industry who honed her journalism skills for nearly eight years at the Michigan Citizen newspaper in Detroit. She joined YES in 2016, establishing and growing the racial justice beat, which has become a cornerstone of YES's coverage. As executive editor, Zenobia now directs editorial coverage for YES magazine and manages editorial partnerships. Zenobia, take it away. Thank you, Rebecca, and good day, everyone. I am thrilled to be here today with organizer and political strategist Alicia Garza. Alicia is principal of the Black Futures Lab, co-creator of the hashtag Black Lives Matter, and a co-founder of the Black Lives Matter Global Network. She is also host of the podcast, Lady Don't Take No. That's why I do this and I don't sing, but the podcast is Lady Don't Take No. Alicia has recently added the title author to her proverbial belt with the 2020 publication of her book, The Purpose of Power, How We Come Together When We Fall Apart. Thank you, Alicia, and welcome. I am so glad that you're here with us today. Um, to celebrate, yes, it's 25 years of inspiring people to build a better world. Um, but before we dive in, I want to read some of what I think is one of the most aptly written testimonials about your book. And it captures the book's essence and content, I think. Um, I thought about reading a piece from the book, but then I didn't want to spoil it for everybody who hasn't gotten it yet, because we have a surprising 40% discount. So y'all need to go ahead and pick this up and <laughs> take advantage of that. Um, but so that's my plug for the book, but I do want to read this, um, testimonial from writer, political commentator, and professor of politics, Melissa Harris Perry. Um, she says in this magnificent and engaging text, Alicia Garza deftly combines revealing personal memoir, thorough social history, astute political theory, and pragmatic strategic advice. Through this exquisite narrative, Garza shows why she is a singular figure of her generation, a generation about which everyone is convinced, she writes, that there was something inherently wrong with us. Combining personal and national history, Garza reveals all that is right with the generation forged in the fire of the Clinton era carceral state and coming of age in the era of Obama enforced respectability. Refusing to romanticize any moment or movement, Garza explains both the why and the how of meaningful, impactful organizing 
for and with Black communities. Never cruel, but unflinchingly honest, Garza analyzes the external and internal opponents that have marked Black people's long struggle for justice in this country. She teaches clearly, corrects lovingly, demands boldly, and proceeds fearlessly to fight for the lives of all Black people. This is a text everyone needs to read, to discuss, to debate, to challenge, and to absorb. Alicia is our Ella Baker. Wow, what a tribute and a well-earned praise for such a commanding and timely piece of work. Um, thank you again, Alicia, for being here. Um, we have a, maybe a little under 45 minutes at this time. So you and I are gonna chat for a bit and then we'll take the remaining of our time for you to respond to questions um, from those joining us today. Awesome. Okay, well, so, so let's get ahead. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah, um, let's go ahead and discuss and absorb. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. In the opening of your book, you write that you began when you began, you thought that you'd be writing about the story of Black Lives Matter. Right. But what came about was your own personal journey. Right. And so I think it's fair to say that what's in per, um, the purpose of power is not only what you've learned since um, Black Lives Matter and what has become a global movement, but you're more than 20 years of organizing and movement building. What are some of those lessons and why was it important for you to write this book at this time? Mm. Well, again, thank you so much for having me and hi to everybody who's watching right now. Thanks for joining us. You know, when I started to write this book, I did. I thought it was gonna be a completely different book. I thought it might be helpful to kind of write down all of the things that we'd ever been asked about Black Lives Matter. How do you turn a hashtag into a movement? You know, is it Black Lives Matter or All Lives Matter? But that's not the book that came out when I sat down to start writing. And in fact, a lot of what came out were stories about my mother. And in reflecting upon that, what I learned is that, you know, my mom was so instrumental for me in helping to shape my view of the world, who I thought belonged and didn't belong, and what I think um, needs to happen in order to make the world a better place. And as I was reflecting and writing, I realized that that was actually the book that we needed. We needed a book that could, um, sorry, this is a Zoom thing and there's somebody at my door. <laughs> we needed a book that could be a roadmap, like the roadmap, thank you, that I never got. Um, as an organizer. And I, I feel like part of what we grapple with, especially in this moment of increased activism, increased engagement, and sharpening crisis, is that there are more people than ever now who are tuned into how the world needs to change. But a lot of us don't have answers about where we start, what our contribution can be, what our role can be. And I wanted this book to be a roadmap. I wanted it to be the book that I didn't have when I first started organizing, but the book that I needed. I needed a book that could talk to me about in real time, what was movement building? What is organizing? What does it mean to build power? I needed a book that could show me that all of the questions that I had, all of the experiences that I was having were actually shared experiences. They weren't isolated to just me. Um, which would have given me more confidence, right, when I first started doing this work. And so for me, the whole goal of this book is to be a resource and um, breadcrumbs in the forest for people who are coming into social change, but it's also a way to sharpen um, an ongoing and existing practice for people who have been involved in social change for a long time. And I hope that people who are reading the book are really getting that out of it as well. One of the big lessons that I want to share without giving away everything in the book um, is that it's really important to remember that um, this work is hard. It's not intended to be easy. And I think sometimes when people come into this work, um, they have grand visions and ideas about what this is going to be like, right? We see all the fun stuff. We see the protests, right? We see all of the art and the creativity, but we often don't see the behind the scenes work and all of the work that goes into, you know, massive protests that, that emerge all over the country. We don't see the work that goes into the sexy stuff. And so I want to tell people this work is hard. And the lesson here is that, um, 
we can't let cynicism and despair um, shape the way that we do this work. We actually have to be guided by love. We have to be guided by a vision of what is possible. And our work, the reason that we do that hard work is to close the gap between what is and what can be. And that's just really gotta be guided by a deep sense of love and um, commitment, um, even though the work is hard. So that's one lesson. And there are tons of other ones in the book that I think everybody will get something out of. Yeah, I, I really love that you led with your own story, like your own personal story, because I think sometimes people are, you know, they become overwhelmed with, oh, this is so much, but then they also think that, oh, this person just started that, like this whole influencer, um, you know, trend that's happening right now, like, mm -hmm. oh, she did a hashtag and then she became, you know, famous, this famous movement builder, but you have been doing this work way, you know, a, a much longer than just coming on the scene. And it wasn't about the hashtag, it was about your intentionality and your love for black people where you wrote that statement on, on Twitter, you know, I love you, you know, our lives matter. And so I think that, um, it, I think the space that we're in right now and where folks are in, in the message that is echoing is that it's not about being this like super activist, right? It's about, you know, where you are, you know, finding your place, right? Standing on your square and then doing what you can do with what you have and where you are. So I really appreciate it that it was of the personal story and not, you know, just all of Black Lives Matter, but all of your experiences. Um, why the title though power what what how did you land on that title purpose of power and especially that how we i mean it's so appropriate for right now but it, i mean was that it or was it something that was happening because i would you started the book before you That's know true. the uprisings of 2020 so how did you land on on that title <clears throat> well um you know interestingly when i finally finished the manuscript uh in 2020 early 2020 um, I was talking with a friend of mine, Angela Rye, who some of you might know. Um, she and I were going back and forth and I said, you know, I'm really trying to come up with a title for this book. Now, in our conversation, the whole reason that we got on the phone in the first place was that we started to um, discuss, right, what was at stake coming out of the uh, primaries, the presidential primaries. And we were lamenting about and the fact that we lost a really big opportunity uh, uh, in 2020 to have a progressive candidate for president. And a lot of what that came down to, right, was that we were um, organizing ourselves around who was the farthest left as opposed to organizing ourselves to take power. We needed one of them, right? And it doesn't, right. like the, the nuances between them actually were not important. What was the most important was that we had somebody who was progressive, who was going to challenge corporations, who was going to challenge uh, big capital, right, to um, expand opportunities and to expand access um, for people who are being left out and left behind every single day. And we missed that opportunity. And the reason I think we missed that opportunity is because um, part of what we forget in our work is not that we are trying to find the people who already agree with us, right? We are trying to build power. And I think sometimes in social change work, we um, focus on things like being with people who agree with us. We focus on things like being with people who want the same things and do things the same way that we do. But that's not actually building power. Building power is about making the rules and shaping the rules. Building power is about um, deciding what the agenda is that people who represent us are trying to implement and what happens to them when they um, refuse or fail, right, to move that agenda in a satisfactory way. Power is about who controls the story of who we are and who we can be together. Um, power is about, um, um, where resources go and where they don't go and why. And all of that should shape our activities and our actions when we are organizing and when we are working for social change. 
It's not about building clicks and it's not about um, <laughs> finding bigger and bigger groups of people who already agree with you. It's actually about expanding our ranks, right? And looking for the people who are looking for us, but right now don't have a political home. There are people all over this country who want better health care, who want to make sure that they're not getting evicted or their houses aren't being foreclosed on. There are people all over this country who want to make sure that our schools are quality, who want to make sure that kids get to be kids and that they get to make mistakes, right? And that all kids get to make mistakes, not just some. Um, and yet, unfortunately, sometimes the character of our movement can be so comfortable, right, in the people who already get it, that we forget that building power, right, is also about building majorities. And there are a ton of people who are not organized right now. So the, the title of this book, The Purpose of Power, really comes from um, wanting to make that connection between social change and building power. And I think a lot of us, um, what I've, ex let me say it this way, what I've experienced in 20 years of organizing is that understandings of power and how we build it are actually really elusive. Um, there's not a lot of understanding about the difference between power and empowerment. And a lot of us are operating from a framework of empowerment rather than power building. Um, so I hope that what people get from this book um, is some information about that and perhaps a new way of looking at how it is that we create the change that we long for and that we deserve. Yeah, yeah. I love that you say we're not building cliques, right? Like we don't always have to agree. And you give an example on that in your book where you um, you talk about the the um, how the right was so successful, right? And in um, getting Trump into office ultimately. And you say that um, you have a quote in here from the book. You said, what's important to understand about the right as it evolved in this period is that it's a coalition of factions with distinct concerns, viewpoints, long-term and short-term visions and ideologies. They come together on things they can agree on in the interest of building and maintaining power. This has been key to the right success and its survival. And that thing that they came around was their shared disdain, right, for communism and liberalism, you write. And so in the communities that I've been a part of in my hometown, Detroit, there's a saying that, you know, we're not going to always get along, right? We're not going to always think the same thing. There may be 10 things on this agenda. And if we can get, um, if we can just get, if there's just the one that we agree on, let's work to move that forward. And you pointed, it, and there's more than one because you just named a list of them, right? Um, with housing and healthcare and just poverty overall you know there are climate justice there are a lot of things that i'm sure that we we can agree on so let's focus on those things what can we learn from that right that that being able i mean you touched on it a little bit but from our own failures and mistakes and in in ideas of what that is like you've even had your own experiences right of i don't want to say in but conflict Right. Like, how do you move past that to to focus on what is most important? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, shout out to Detroit. And for any <laughs> Detroiter that's watching right now, what up, though? <laughs> what up, though? <laughs> um, I, I also want to say that Detroit has taught me so much about this very point. Um, and in a lot of ways, what I wanted to get across here is, um, you know, we don't have the luxury of um, cutting people away, right? When there's so much at stake for us and the crises are so big. One of the reasons that Detroit organizing is so impactful and powerful is that, frankly, um, Detroiters have been fighting an uphill battle against corporate power, against corruption, um, for decades <laughs> and there wasn't a choice to say, well, we're not gonna work with these people and we're not gonna work with these people because look, there's no water and people are poor right. and people can't eat. And so we can't actually, we don't have the luxury of cutting people off that basically want the same things we do when we're up against these giants that really wanna make sure that we don't get the things that we need to live well. Mm -hmm. So. One of the things I think is important about this conversation about the right 
is not us learning how to be like them. And in fact, right. what makes us lovely, right, is that we are really rooted in a love for humanity. Um, we are really rooted in a sense of dignity and integrity, and they are not. Um, mm -hmm. So we don't want to replicate what they do, but we can certainly learn from how it is that they've built the most powerful movement in this country over the last 40 years. And the way right. that they've done that is to get clear about what it is that they're actually fighting for. They have multiple factions that don't get along. Um, in this last four years, we saw all of the ways in which you know, the, emer the emergence of Donald Trump actually set those factions afire, right? Some of them were like, this guy's a complete idiot and we can't have him be the leader of, right, of, right. The, party, <laughs> of the opposition. And then others of them were like, look, you better get it you better get clear about this. Like he's actually moving a lot of people and we need to get behind him. Sure, I don't agree with all of the nutso things that he's saying, but right. it doesn't matter. He can have power and therefore our agenda could have power. Right. So part of what I want to encourage us to think about, to ground ourselves in, right, is what do we actually need to accomplish things together? And who do we need to be to accomplish things together? Is it fundamentally necessary that we agree on every piece of language, every tactic, every possible strategy? Or is it necessary that we create the kinds of containers, the kinds of vehicles that can hold a bunch of things at once while moving in the same direction? Um, mm -hmm. What we know is that the Tea Party and the evangelical right and the racist right they have different approaches, different tactics, different strategies, but they all are focused on power. And so where they come together and how they um, diverge from one another is still very much focused on how do we get to the end goal? The evangelicals don't want the, to do the same things that the racist right is doing, but they also kind of know they need each other to be successful. So <laughs> they figure mm -hmm. it out, right? Right, right. <laughs> and so that's something that I think we can really learn from. We have such a breadth and a depth of strategies and tactics and experiences and approaches and methods that actually should be much more generative than, than I think we allow space for. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, even when we're looking at the current um, um, infrastructure negotiations. You can't see this from where I am right now. No, no. Directly in front of me, I have CNN and a, there's a big uh, uh, picture of Steve Bannon right now. <laughs> That's scary. No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in these conversations about infrastructure, right? One of the things that we can see very clearly is how these factions are organizing and aligning themselves. Mm -hmm. And we can also see what happens when different strategies and approaches when under the same umbrella and coordinated can actually complement each other and help move the agenda forward. Mm -hmm. Who, what, how would we be at this part of the conversation if there weren't activists and organizers who were bird dogging Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin, while at the same time there are, um, you know, legislators and policymakers and policy advocates, right, who are pushing from a different perspective. You actually yeah. need all of it in order to be yeah. successful. Um, so that's what I'm trying to uh, get to there. And that is what yeah. I'm trying to inspire us to think bigger about. Not how we yeah. can be the right, but how we right. can use the lessons of how they've built power to build our own. Yeah. And it's unfortunate sometimes that it seems like on this, the left, and, and I use that term loosely because there are a lot of folks in, in black communities who don't refer to themselves as progressives or liberals or or any or the left or any of that. Most However, of we all yeah. most of <laughs> right, right. But we all still but we're fighting for the same thing though, right? right. And some but sometimes a lot of our um actions that we do take are reactionary, right? Like so last year with the uprisings right and so and with covid and with the um the the uh, voting restrictions after the general election you know all these things is what then put people who are not used to fighting or are not used to activism or are not used to using their voice to be out and about to say okay now there's a problem right so we we tend to do that um and so we do have more people 
who are now responding to the problem. What does that mean? Um, do you think that means for, and maybe they're not joining movements, but maybe they're doing something in their own spaces, but it's, I would say that that's a plus, that's something, and then how do they keep going, right, and not stop, like, this year because it's like oh that happened last year we were in the streets for months and and i know you weren't a part of any of that organizing but just the fact that people were you know responding right and so now no you know there's not been any you know national um attention being drawn to people who are still being killed by police right um and so folks kind of some of them are going back to business as usual but what does it mean that we had that that groundswell of just like millions of people out around the around the world right and how do we sustain that well <clears throat> it means that it means a few things um number one it means that um more and more people are being impacted by the crises that organize our world right now and more and more people are feeling that it also means that we have done incredible work over the last decade to break through to push through from being um, um, only known in our own circles, right? To shifting a global conversation about race, racism and structural inequity. That's important. Mm -hmm. But it also tells us a little bit about how our movements can grow and change. Um, you know, this conversation about black communities is so dear to my heart because that's the work I do every day. And people are shocked when I say, I never use the word progressive when I'm talking to other black folks. I never use the word left. And it's not because I'm not a leftist and it's not because I'm not a progressive. It's because our communities, just in the same way that we've been left out and left behind from government and governance, we've also been left out and left behind um, from progressive movements. And that is, both about the imperfections of human beings that are trying to do um, things that don't, and trying to live in a world that doesn't exist right now. And it's also a little bit about laziness. So um, I think it's important for us to just acknowledge, right, that our movements need to adapt to um, ensure that people don't get left out and left behind. That's one. Mm -hmm. but the second thing I think it shows us is that, um, it's never been enough. It's never been enough just to fight unjust systems. It always has to be complemented by a clear and coherent vision for what we want instead. And, you know, in every kind of moment of uprising, you are always going to have attrition. That's just a fact. And I think sometimes people get really disheartened because we see a bunch of people in the streets and then we're like, well, how come people aren't taking more action? Well, to be honest, right, not everybody is um, uh, clear about what action they can take besides getting into the streets. And number two, um, you know, there's just a reality that um, for a lot of folks, right, if there's not a, a place for them to be absorbed into, yes, they're going to go back to exactly what they were doing before. Right. So that's a conversation for us about our infrastructure. like. Where are the places that we are plugging people into um, where they can take action on the things that are most meaningful for them? It's exactly mm -hmm. why I created the Black Futures Lab and the Black to the Future Action Fund, because we work to make Black communities powerful in politics so we can be powerful in the rest of our lives. And one of the gaps that we're trying to address here is that um, our organizing infrastructure um, isn't 21st century ready. Um, and so we need to make sure there are multiple places where people can take a range of actions on the things that they care about and that they feel and experience that the action that they take actually has some kind of impact. Um, so that's something that I think we need to be paying attention to. And then lastly, I will just say that um, one thing that I think is also deeply important um, is to remind ourselves and each other um, that it's never just been protest that has brought about change. And this right. is a narrative question that I think we really have to dig deep into. I too was raised with all of the stories about the last period of civil rights um, that were ahistorical. They were fairy tales, essentially. I mean, we got taught that 
um, Rosa Parks. She was just a seamstress who was too tired to move to the back of the bus. And mm -hmm. that kicked off, you know, a 384 day uh, 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 bus boycott in Montgomery, mm -hmm. Alabama, when actually Rosa Parks was a seasoned organizer. Right, right. <laughs> right. I, you know, we got taught that, you know, there were superheroes who basically fell from the sky, like Martin Luther King or, or, or Malcolm X, right, who who showed up and automatically um, were positioned to lead uh, a community. And that's just not the truth. And as long as we t learn those stories in that way, it's also how we understand how change happens. And it does mm -hmm. a huge disservice to us seeing our own agency and power um, as change makers and as people um, who can be change agents. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, this book is really about how can each of us find our potential of being a change maker? How do yeah. we better understand what change making means and how do we find our appropriate contribution? Not everybody, and in fact, not many people will ever find themselves behind a podium addressing tens of thousands of people. Right. But that's not what's required to make change. Um, and so hopefully through reading this book, you get a better understanding of what is required and what your particular role could be. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're not, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I, I do want you to talk about um, the work you're doing um, at, at Future Labs, um, because you I know you have this theme of voting as movement, right? That is picking up, but can you talk more about what that's like um, and what the expectation is from um, Black folks, of course, but others who can support in that work that you all are doing who are not Black? Um, so if you could just yeah. kind of talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. Well, you can learn a lot about us at blackfutureslab.org. And our work is really about making Black communities powerful in politics so we can be powerful in the rest of our lives. Here's what that looks like. We collect recent and relevant data about who Black communities are, what we experience every day, and what we want to see for our futures. And we use that data, we use those stories to change the narrative about who Black people are and what we want and what we deserve. But we also use that data to impact and shape good public policy that is race forward, not race neutral, that holds government accountable and responsible for um, meeting the needs of its subjects and its citizens. And then also um, that moves a progressive agenda and that fully roots um, uh, a, a progressive agenda in the needs of our communities. We don't um, pretend, right, that there's anything that the conservative movement has to offer Black communities. Um, and right. that's, a, that's right. a new conversation in the world. Um, mm -hmm. We also motivate, mobilize, educate, and activate Black voters across the country. And in fact, in 2020, during our first ever field program, um, we were able to talk to over a million Black voters on our C3 side and a million Black voters on our C4 side. And what that tells me, right, is that there are lots of people out there who need to be and want to be engaged, not just when we need something from them, but all year round. It's important right. to ensure that our communities are a critical and integral part of every decision that is being made about us right now without us. Um, the other thing that we do is we build the capacity of our communities to be powerful and win. And in fact, um, just last month, we launched our second annual Black to the Future Public Policy Institute, where we're training Black people from Black communities how to write, win, and implement new rules in cities and states. And what that looks like, for example, is supporting organizations like the Young Women's Freedom Center, um, which has a bill on the governor's desk right now that they uh, helped to design in our institute last year uh, that changes the sentencing guidelines for people who um, have, have committed crimes and they have domestic violence or intimate partner violence in their backgrounds, right? Mm -hmm. And what that's going to mean, right, is that um, families will stay together. It's going to mean that communities stay a little bit more intact. Um, but if we don't have the tools of public policy in our hands, um, those tools are often and can often be used against us. So that's a little bit of the work that we do at the Black Futures Lab. We also partner with Black grassroots 
uh, organizations across the country to ensure that they have the tools and the infrastructure they need to be strong so that our communities can be strong. I mean, that means that we train folks how to build their organizations, how to grow their organizations. Um, and we try to make sure, right, that those organizations are strong and equipped to be able to be in this fight of our lifetimes. So that's a little bit about the work that we do. And if you want to learn more about us, again, please visit blackfutureslab.org. We believe that um, voting is important, but it's not the only tool that we need to use to be powerful. But we also believe, right, that um, a lot of the reason that people come in and out of being engaged in our democracy is because democracy is not working as hard for us as we are working for it. For it and we yeah. have to change that equation in order to be powerful. Thank you so much, uh, Alicia. Um, we do have some questions that I want to get in because I know we don't have much more time. Um, Lori wants to know, how can you measure impact to know if you're making any? Mm. Well, it's about how our communities talk about our presence, our work, and our impact. Um, so it's not just a one-way conversation, right? We hear from people all the time about how we're shaping um, their lives and their perspectives. Um, the other the other way that you can measure impact is by participation. Um, and it's important, I think, uh, to be checking for, you know, is this a valuable resource for Black communities? How do we know? Do Black folks show up? <laughs> right, right. So that's some of the way I think we can measure that. All right. Natalie wants to know um, if you can speak to the difference between online and offline organizing, and um, how do we bring people from online to in-person? And how do they complement each other? Oh, yeah. Well, they can complement each other when used together well um, and when intentional. Online organizing uh, often involves um, engaging people's online profiles, right, to take action on a thing. Um, usually we ask people to do things like sign a petition. We ask people to do things like share some information with 10 of their friends. Um, and then, of course, offline organizing can look a whole range of ways, but it's really all about uh, building relationships uh, so that we can take collective action together. And that can also be true of digital organizing, but it requires a strategy, just like offline organizing requires a strategy. And the best way to combine online and offline organizing is to create community on both sides um, and give people concrete actions to take that don't just land in one place or the other. Um, I'm not somebody who wants to kind of engage in the, is one better than the other one? Instead, right. I want us to talk about how we can be creative in using both to complement each other so that we can get closer to where we want to be. I think Black Lives Matter is a really good example of how we've brought people together online to take action together yeah. offline, um, but we're not the only ones and we're not the first ones to do it. Uh, organizations like Color of Change do this very thing yes. and they do it um, at scale, they have, I want to say they have more than 7 million members online. <laughs> I think the number is eight. I think when I spoke to someone over there, they said like Excellent. around 8 million. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And that's yeah. because they are being creative and combining online and offline strategies. Um, yes, they mobilize people online, but they also bring people together in community um, offline. And I've been um, uh, uh, very lucky to be a part of things like their their black women's brunches, right? That they've held across the country, bringing people that don't know each other together to share a meal and take action. Uh, they also have incredible work that they're doing with squads around the country who are leading excellent policy campaigns um, that are changing the rules in cities and states across the nation. So um, those are some good examples of how those things can come together well. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts and feelings about bioregional governance as a way to transcend the nationalistic issue? That's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, but okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into more about bioregional <laughs> governance and I'll circle back okay. to that. Okay, no problem. Um, there, So with folks coming out and just want to, because I do have one more question from the audience, but I want to end on that one because it's more of an uplifting, positive question. This one is more to some of the, the unhelpfulness that is happening in movement building and organizing and, and, and harm being done. And if you can just speak to an example of something that you've wished, witnessed rather, or have experienced that folks are doing um, that 
they cannot do. <laughs> you know, it's like, don't do this, do that. Like this mm -hmm. is these actions that you're like, I know you want to help, right? I know you want to do this, but but just some of those things of, because I think when people, they get like kind of overzealous and they want to be a part of the thing and they don't really know how. And so how do you show up without knowing so that you're not causing harm? Um, I think showing up with curiosity and showing up um, being ready to follow is important. Um, as somebody who's been a part of movements for at least 20 years now, what I can say is that I really like being in the back. Um, there's something really wonderful about um, following somebody else's leadership um, and really helping to support other people to be leaders. And sometimes our leadership is not called for, our participation is called for. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes our leadership is called for, and it's really a question of um, being able to strike the balance and know the difference. Um, and I think that one mistake people make often is that they get so excited about being a part of this movement, but they think that their entry point is to be the leader, the decision maker, the strategy designer. And actually um, it's important to, um, uh, be curious when you come into something, knowing that um, you're not the first one who ever thought about a thing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> there are lots of people right. um, who, who need you. They need your hands. They need your brain. They need your talents and your skills. Um, and sometimes um, it's important to just take the time to learn about what's been done so that you can contribute in the most helpful, effective, and impactful way. Yeah. Wow, Alicia, 20 years is, you know, some folks have been doing it for 30, 40, 50 plus, I and know. I get that, I but like still within our, stuff. right, but, but 20 years is still a long time. 20 yeah. years is still a long time. So how do you, with all the other experience, like all the experiences, of course, are not positive ones, you know, not just from folks outside and who don't agree, but even from within, how do you keep love at the center of what you do? Because that's kind of how you start it. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do you how do you keep that at the center of what it is that you do? I, I think, honestly, it's about having compassion for myself and other people. Um, that's the answer that I'm going to give today. Okay. I'm not always <laughs> loving. I don't always feel loving towards this movement. And I'll tell you, um, the last decade in particular, I think, has been really hard. Hard. Um, yes. And yes. With that. Right. Um, what experience brings you and time brings you is um, more space for opening. And what I recognize is, again, that we are trying to accomplish things and we have accomplished things that have not been done before. And in that, the messiness of what it means to be human in there is going to come all the way out. And I'm yeah, actually yeah. more grateful for that than I am bitter about it. Yeah. So where my love comes from, right, is being able to be compassionate for myself and for others who are attempting to do extraordinary things as ordinary people. Thank you so much, Alicia, and much gratitude to you for joining us today. That is all the time that we have, everyone. Um, you take care and be well and looking forward to your next book. Thank you, much <laughs> love to y'all. Thanks right, for having me. Bye. Back to you, Rebecca. Rebecca. Thank you, Zenobia and Alicia. The book is The Purpose of Power, How We Come Together When We Fall Apart. And as a benefit of joining us today, you can get a copy of the book for a special price by using the link in the chat. All right, everyone. This is going to be your last chance to enter to win a rad power electric bike. Click on that link in the, in the chat to enter yourself in the drawing. <laughs> the inspiration and celebrations continue. We first wrote about Taina Ashili in 2016 after she penned the Black Lives Matter anthem, And We Walk. Today, she's here to perform Plant the Seed, a song inspired by her closest friend and friend of yes, Leah Penniman of Soul Fire Farm, and their work together in the movement to end racism and injustice in the food system. Hi everyone, my name is Taina Sili, and this is Gaetano Vaccaro. And I wanna thank you so much for joining us here today in upstate New York. 
This song that we're going to perform for you today is called Plant the Seed. This is my declaration to be fully alive, fully alive, healing. This is my reclamation of my ancestral, ancestral wisdom. The earth, it saved it for me. And I
Thank you. Mm, thank you, Taina, for that fantastic performance. You can learn more about Taina Asili and her projects at the link in the chat. I want to take a moment to check in with all of you in the audience. So head to the chat right now and let us know what is a key insight or takeaway that you have learned about during Yes Fest? You know, and I think my biggest takeaways are hmm, just learning how everything is interconnected, that racism isn't an isolated incident and it affects everything from client change to the food chain. And Shelly, how about you? You know, I have to say ditto, but I also really was struck by the number of times people talked about community and talked about our interconnectedness and how in the collective there is the power to create change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastical. Yes, indeed. It's been a fantastic couple of days, hasn't it? It has. It has indeed. Whew. Well, if we can get a little more. There we go. All right. Let's see. What do we got in the chat over here? Yes, people are still reacting to that fantastic voice that Taina has. Oh, it was such a stirring, stirring moment indeed. And you can see the link is up there now where you can find out more about them at tainaseely.com. Mm -hmm. We're about to bring you our final performer of the day. This means we're going to close the end of our two-day festival. If you want to invest in this work, the time is now. I'll remind you that our board members have put before challenges at the 500, at the 750, excuse me, 500, 1,000, and 2,500 levels. There's still space and room for you to make an investment. Remember, there is no obligation we're happy you're here to celebrate the 25 years of yes. But if you do wish to make a donation, a couple of fun reminders for you. Remember, remember that everybody who gives a gift between one and $50 will be entered into a drawing for a yes prize pack. Also remember that all gifts in all amounts will be matched up to $60,000. We hope you feel encouraged to invest in this amazing journalism. And of course, we have another board challenge to announce. Hmm. That's right. We do. Our board member, Elizabeth Sanders, is asking 60 of you to join her at that $250 level. Oh, so I'm going to look and see where we are at right now. We've raised $105,000. Woohoo! That is amazing. Over $100,000, $105,114 over the course of two days is amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have added in the match money so that you may notice that the gifts have come in so far today have just been doubled, but there's no reason to stop there. Let us take this to the limit, people. Let us do our best to propel Yes powerfully into the next 25 years. We are so grateful for you. There is no such thing as thanking you too much. Absolutely not. And right now I want to thank Jackie and Paul. I want to thank William Turner, Kim, Allison, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we've come to the moment. I know that some of you are really excited for as a token of thanks to all of you for simply tuning in and celebrating with us. Mm -hmm. We're conducting the drawing for that brand new rad power electric bike Ooh. all right and if you can give me a drum roll in the chat i'll do it right here the winner is diana mccarter from philadelphia hey, yay diana. diana and so diana a a congratulations to you and a <laughs> member of yes's staff will be in in connection with you to to talk to you about how you receive your e-bike. Yes, congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we want to send you back out into your day feeling joyful. So we'll conclude our two-day festival with one final treat. There's always one final treat. Oh, one final treat. Rolling Stone has described the work of this next performer as, quote, the sound of everyone who's hungry for change, steadying themselves and marching toward a common goal. Please welcome Chris Pierce. Hey everybody, my name is Chris Pierce. I'm coming at you from Los Angeles, California. I'm very, very honored to be here today to join you for Yes Magazine's two-day virtual online celebration. Uh, it means a lot to me uh, that Yes Magazine invited me uh, for what they stand for, for a more just, sustainable, and compassionate uh, 
environment. And um, thank you for having me. Um, and I'm also happy to be here because Yes Magazine is celebrating the 25th anniversary. Um, so what a better way than to celebrate through music, uh, the power of change. Um, and uh, I'm happy to, to uh, offer my song, American Silence, which is the title song for my latest album. Uh, this song I feel like is fitting for today. It's about, uh, it's about uh, confronting complacency uh, and asking folks to actually stand up for what they believe in, uh, the things that affect them, their, the environment and those around them. Um, this is American Silence. Thank you very much. Will you rise up when your comfort is in jeopardy? Will you resist justifying the complexities? Is simplicity convenient in your quest to pacify? When you look in the mirror, can you see your own disguise? Can we sing a song for you? Will music move your heart and mind? Will our song rescue American silence is a crime. We see the music move you as you lay your burden down. We feel the music grip you as your heart is soaked in sound. And when the song is over, if you decide to clap aloud, Will your applause mean anything with stitches on your mouth? Can we sing a song for you? Will music move your heart and mind? Will our song rescue? American silence is a crime. We sing for the freedom, we fight for all it's worth. We sing for humanity so we can all walk the earth. We sing with honor to live to sing another song. And we'll sing through the pain and we'll keep on marching on. Can we sing a song for you? Oh, will music move your heart and mind? Will our song rescue? American silence. American silence. American silence is a crime. Yes, it is a crime. Yes, it is a crime. It is a crime. Yes, it is a crime. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. You can learn more about Chris Pierce at the link in the chat. This brings us to the conclusion of our two-day festival. I have loved serving as your co mc Thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Myself as well. If you're not watching this live, you can still take advantage of our match for one week. The donation link and text to give will stay live until Friday, October 15th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you so much for joining Yes Fest, A Better World Rising, and for celebrating with us. Have a very, very good day. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you. 